Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome to all attendees this afternoon uh, to this, the fifth Green Hydrogen Webinar for Southern Africa. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host and moderator at this webinar, signing in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to Robert Chakuti, who is the head of the Trade and Economic Section at the European Union Delegation to South Africa, and to European Union Ambassador to South Africa, Dr. Rina Kionka. And a big welcome to our presenters this afternoon, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees today, for your interest and participation. This is the fifth in a series of five webinars that explore the policies, business case, technologies, and opportunities provided by green hydrogen and its derivatives. We have over 1,700 delegates that have registered to attend this webinar and to hear what Ambassador Kionka and the presenters have to say on the subject. The webinar will launch a detailed CSIR study report commissioned by the EU South Africa Partners for Growth Program on the near-term decarbonization potential unlocked by the presence of large-scale hydrogen production and, and its export from ports situated in the Western and Eastern Cape, namely the ports of Saldana Bay and Kucha. May I express a big thanks, Roberto, for opening this webinar and to Ambassador Kionke for honoring us with her insights and to the European Union delegation to South Africa for co-hosting this webinar with EE Business Intelligence. I am truly grateful for your support and the work that you've done to support South Africa's growing interest in renewable hydrogen and green power fuel opportunities arising in South Africa and of course in the region. May I also acknowledge and thank the Boston Consulting Group, Plug Power and Royal Hasconing DHV for your most valued sponsorship of this webinar. And finally, may I thank the European Union South Africa Partners for Growth Program for facilitating this uh, CSIR report. This, it is the second report that they have facilitated, this one on stimulating domestic hydrogen production and consumption and export opportunities in South Africa. It's presented today uh, by uh, Thomas Ruiz, uh, and his colleague, Lindo, who I will introduce or who will be introduced to you in due course, both of them from the CSIR of South Africa. All persons that registered to attend the webinar today will shortly receive a copy of this important document that is being announced here today. It will be in about a week's time that all of you will receive this document. And please do note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to view the webinar will be made available publicly afterwards. So while this presentation is in progress, please do send us your questions on the Q&A text facility. Uh, we've set aside half an hour after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. But may I now introduce to you uh, Robert Chikuti, who will formally open the webinar and introduce Ambassador Dr. Rina Kionka. So, uh, Roberto, uh, Roberto, a uh, little bit of background on, uh, on you. And uh, so as of 1st of September 2019, Roberto has been the head of the trade and economic section of the European Union delegation to South Africa. Uh, between January 2017 and August 2019, Roberto worked in the trade department of the European Commission and was responsible for the bilateral trade and investment relations uh, between the EU and six countries of the Southern African Development Community, specifically following issues related to the EU SADC Economic Partnership Agreement. Before this, Roberto held similar positions serving bilateral trade and investment relations with India, China, Mongolia, and Papua New Guinea. Roberto is Italian and he graduated in law and he has a master's degree in European studies and followed specialized studies on international development and anthropology. So it's my great pleasure now to hand over to Roberto to officially open this uh, webinar. 
Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and I see that you read very, very carefully my CV. I have to be more careful in actually in the documents uh, I distribute. Uh, but uh, good afternoon to everybody, to you, Chris, but also to all speakers uh, and to the, the participants uh, to this fifth uh, Green Hydrogen uh, webinar. Uh, I wanted to especially thank uh, the speakers here today the CSIR um, colleagues and friends uh, with whom uh, we have been working together in the past uh, uh, year and a half, uh, but also our friends from Boston Consulting, from Plug Power and from Royal Hakoning DHIV. We are very, very lo much looking forward to hearing uh, a bit of their stance and their take uh, on green hydrogen. Uh, and uh, Chris, you mentioned that very clearly, uh, the number of people that have registered uh, in this event, uh, around 1,700 is a clear sign actually of uh, the interest that green hydrogen has uh, now in South Africa. Uh, we have participants in fact from government, from private sector and for civil society. And I remember when we first started working on green hydrogen here in December, 2019, not many people were aware or ever heard about what green hydrogen was about. Hydrogen, of course, uh, as a, as a element of the periodic table, but not what are the possibilities around the green hydrogen. And the uh, discussions uh, uh, around this in the last year and a half uh, have been developing uh, uh, in an incredible way here in South Africa. So what we are going to do today is, of course, to hear uh, the, uh, the stance of the presentation of our speakers, uh, and specifically of uh, the work we have been doing with the CSIR. Uh, with whom we have been doing two studies, as you mentioned, Chris rightly. Our first study was published in February, and that was more focused on the export opportunities around green hydrogen uh, towards the European Union, but also towards Japan. Uh, but of course, uh, an export oriented economy can only work uh, if there is also domestic demand, uh, because that creates economies of scale. And this is why we had commissioned this second study with CSIR, which will be soon published uh, and which uh, about which we will hear today. And it is about stimulating domestic hydrogen con um, uh, consumption opportunities uh, in South Africa. All in all, we are very encouraged actually as the EU to support a process which is clearly driven by South Africa. And this is the important element that we are aligning behind something that South Africa is driving. And President Ramaphosa himself made that very clear very, very recently when he clearly mentioned that the path towards decarbonization in South Africa goes through three channels mainly. One is through, of course, the commissioning of coal plants and more intake by renewable energy. The second would be via green hydrogen and the third one via electrical vehicles. We are very much encouraged also by the outcomes of COP26 in Glasgow just a couple of weeks ago. And the ambassador of the European Union very soon will touch upon an important political declaration what was made in Glasgow and it has a, a, quite a significant impact for South Africa. Uh, but without further ado now, I would like to introduce you actually the ambassador of the European Union here in South Africa, Dr. Rina Kionka. Dr. Rina Kionka has actually quite an impressive uh, um, professional background, but she's also quite an impressive human being. So as a, a, a professional background, she has been working uh, in the Estonian foreign ministry in her past, uh, but she has also been working then uh, in uh, key institutions of the European Union. First of all, uh, at the Council, uh, at the uh, Secretariat of the Euro Council of the European Union, uh, where she was uh, 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 representing actually the Secretary General and High Representative uh, Javier Solana on human rights. Uh, and before that, she was also working uh, on the UN, uh, America's counterterrorism and human rights issues. Then she has been working at the European External Action Service, which is a bit the foreign uh, ministry of the European Union, leading on uh, uh, Central Asian uh, countries uh, and on human rights issues. And before joining uh, as ambassador of the European Union here in South Africa, she was a chief foreign policy advisor of the president of the European Council, uh, uh, Mr. Donald Tusk. 
But as I said at the beginning, um, Rina is also quite an impressive human being, uh, and that maybe is uh, equally, if not in, more important than the professional experience. Uh, she has a passion for art, for culture, and for literature. She is an avid reader, actually, of books, uh, and I know that she has read not only literature and um, uh, South African literature, but also actually since she joined South Africa, even issues relating actually more to the economy, to the financial aspect, uh, and of course, uh, of South Africa. And of course, now, Rina has become one of the spearhead of green transitioning of our economies, uh, which is a priority for all of us. Uh, but without further ado, Rina, I'm happy to give the floor to you for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. And um, next time I'm going to cut down my uh, CV before I send it to you. But thanks for the, the very complimentary introductory remarks and good morning, colleagues, partners, and friends. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to address uh, once again a webinar on, on green hydrogen. I remember after the last webinar, I tweeted, you know, hydrogen is everybody's favorite element on the periodic table now. And indeed, that's true. Uh, the last time we met at the, the first uh, Green Hydrogen webinar, um, which was masterfully hosted and coordinated by Chris Yelland, um, that was in February of this year. But since then, I have noticed how quickly uh, the conversation on green hydrogen has really taken off here in South Africa. I understand that the South African government is doing significant work on green hydrogen through Dr. Ramagopa's office in the presidency and the Department of Science and Technology, Science and Innovation. Uh, we've also been discussing uh, at, uh, with the uh, Industrial Development Cooperation, which has been mandated by the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition to explore the commercialization of green hydrogen in the country. As the EU, together with our member states in a Team Europe spirit, we remain committed to assisting on this not very easy path to a de decarbonized economy in South Africa. This is another opportunity also for the EU and South Africa to take advantage of what we have as a privileged partnership, a strategic partnership. So green hydrogen clearly ranks high on the EU's own path toward a climate neutral continent. And indeed, as noted recently by, by our friends over at Hydrogen Europe, and I quote, hydrogen has seen an unprecedented development from an innovative niche technology to a systemic element in the EU's efforts to transition to a climate neutral society in 2050, end of quote. The clear, EU clearly has a significant interest in green hydrogen centered primarily on the contribution it could make to a deep decarbonization of our economies. And without a doubt, we have a long way to go, but we're moving forward and we're confident that we can work on this together with South Africa as well. So let me briefly highlight how um, the EU uh, intends to lead in this and other areas, while at the same time aligning behind South Africa's intention to move to a more sustainable economy. Let's start with the four point agenda that president of the European Commission, Dr. von der Leyen laid out in her opening speech at Glasgow um, on how to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. She first, she said a strong collective commitment to reduce uh, emissions by 2030 with net zero by 2050 is okay, but it's not enough. We need to urgent action in the next decade. Two, two, we need robust rules to make um, global carbon markets a reality. Three, we need to mobilize climate finance. And Team Europe, by the way, is the largest provider of close to 27 billion USD in 2020, and there's more to come. And four, we need to scale up the deployment of innovation and technology. So I think that we can all agree that hydrogen could and it should play a major role in our energy mix going forward. The vice president of the European Commission in charge of the Green Deal, Franz Timmermans, consistently re reiterates that Africa is Europe's sister continent. Indeed, we're, we're sisters or brothers. Uh, Europe cannot prosper without Africa prospering. And when Af Af Europe prospers, then Africa can also prosper. And the same can be said of South Africa. 
And that's my one of my main messages this morning is we're in this together and we're stronger together. And this leads me to the um, this historical agreement that uh, Roberto alluded to in his introductory remarks, uh, which was reached at COP, um, and it directly concerns South Africa. It's a partnership on a just energy transition driven and owned by South Africa with the support of the EU, Germany, France, the US and the UK. We're fully on board with South Africa when we hear the legitimate concerns about decarbonization of the economy. And that's why we're committed to earmark altogether 8.5 billion USD um, to support such an energy transition in full respect for South Africa's policies and legislation. And that's the first step. Despite the gloom and the doom surrounding the climate crisis and the dire situation economically in South Africa, there are still reasons to feel optimistic and congratulate South Africa indeed for taking a lead uh, in this path toward green recovery. But the only way we can get to where we need to be is for people to maintain an optimistic outlook and to mobilize funds and also mobilize ideas. And that, dear participants, uh, brings me to where we, what we're doing here all today. I look forward to hearing um, from the CSIR on the second uh, piece of research that we have supported, um, this time looking at stimulating domestic hydrogen consumption opportunities in South Africa. In addition, I look forward to hearing the perspectives of the private sector, uh, with whom I'm very happy to share the platform today. And now before I close, let me also announce that for the first time, the EU will be funding a green hydrogen study tour to Europe for South African government officials who are drilling down on this issue. The study tour was scheduled to depart next weekend, um, but unfortunately it's been postponed to February, 2022 because of the worsening COVID situation in Europe. But the visit when it does take place will be an opportunity to share perspectives, engage in policy discussions, and visit hydrogen projects on the ground. I really hope that the outcomes from today will be useful in, in informing the, the discussions that take place during the study tour. So in conclusion, let me just once again reiterate the EU's commitment to South Africa and uh, our readiness to stand by uh, and partner on this increasingly important topic of green hydrogen. I wish you all a, a very good seminar uh, webinar and thought-provoking discussions. And now back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for those words. Uh, Ambassador, we, it was our pleasure to meet you at the first hydrogen webinar that we conducted uh, earlier this year. I think it was in uh, February this year. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you again at this last webinar on green hydrogen uh, in this year. Uh, in, in uh, November, as we head towards the end of the year. It's been a pleasure. It's, it's important for us to hear your words. And one of my takeaways and, and a message that I want to make to this audience is that this initiative, this Green Hydrogen Initiative, the series of webinars, this is a South African initiative, is driven by South Africa, for South Africa. The, the work of the study group is done by South Africans at the CSIR uh, for the benefit of our country. And I am grateful for the supportive role, uh, not the prescriptive role, but for the supportive role that the EU has played uh, in this process and is continuing to play uh, in the development of our economy. And I'm a strong believer in partnering. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's what today is also about. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, this initiative is a South African initiative for and by South Africa. And it's really a privilege to have you here in this role supporting our in initiatives, our economy, and our efforts uh, in, in partnership. So thank you very much, Ambassador, for your kind participation. Uh, so it's now my uh, uh, privilege to introduce you to uh, two speakers uh, from uh, the CSIR uh, who have done a lot of this uh, research work uh, and have produced a study report. It's uh, not 100% complete at this stage, but it's uh, about to be published and will be shared with everybody who registered uh, to attend this 
uh, webinar. So uh, uh, the two uh, uh, presenters from the CSRR are Thomas Ruiz and Lindo Mbata. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas and Lindo, for your presence. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Thomas, and Thomas is going to introduce uh, Lindo uh, in due course. Uh, so Thomas Ruiz is a senior research engineer at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, uh, the CSIR, uh, in the Energy Center. His 27-year uh, research career at the CSIR has been predominantly in the field of thermodynamics, heat transfer, turbo machinery, and energy. His current interests lie in providing evidence-based uh, economic motivation for the development of a South African renewable hydrogen export market. So uh, a person who's done a lot of work, uh, he presented uh, the first CSIR study at our first webinar in February this year on green hydrogen. And uh, it's great to have you back again, Thomas, uh, with, with the second report. And uh, you are going to uh, lead us into this uh, before handing over to Lindo, uh, who will present uh, on a different aspect of the report. So over to you now, Thomas. And Thank please you share your presentation. Much. I will do so. Right, jolly good. Um, the title of the presentation is looking at the, the potential local offtake volumes that are possible uh, by the presence of a renewable hydrogen export supply at the ports of Soldana Bay and Moha. Um, my um, uh, co-authors of the study, Linda Kuchle Mbata, Fiona Olo, and Mamelo Chauke. Now, as with the previous presentation, I'd like to start with a spoiler alert so that people know what it is that we're going to say. Firstly, South Africa can produce renewable hydrogen competitively with other coastal countries. We've said it before, and we've got more data for it now. Secondly, a hydrogen supply for export from the ports of Soldana Bay and Ruha also allow nearby hard to abate sectors to decarbonize, helping South Africa to meet its emissions targets. Um, the prior work has been summarized by Chris and uh, Ambassador Kionke, uh, 2020, the EU delegation commissioned the first study. It was presented the following year, 2021, this year, in February at Chris Yellen's first hydrogen webinar, where we had more than a thousand attendees and great media coverage. There were two major conclusions from that study. Firstly, as I said, that South Africa could produce hydrogen competitively. And secondly, that two South African deep water ports were particularly um, well placed to be. Um, uh, useful for hydrogen export, Soldana Bay for Europe and Mucha for the Far East. The EU DSA then decided to fund a follow-up study, um, loosely paraphrases, how does such a supply benefit industry in the nearby vicinity? And this webinar produces those results. The report will be available once complete. So to recap, um, those who have uh, attended the previous presentation will have seen this slide. What are power fuels? They are fuels all based on hydrogen obtained by the electrolysis of water using renewable electricity. They are necessary to decarbonize hard to abate sectors that are not easily electrified with renewable electricity. The hard to abate sectors of interest you can see on the slide are being in industry, steel making, ammonia, cement, and plastics, and in transport, those heavy duty long distance transport um, uh, vectors. There are two countries particularly interested in importing bulk amounts of green hydrogen. It's not exclusive, it's not exhaustive, but they are the dominant ones and they're worthy of being examined here. Germany in 2030 has stated in their green hydrogen strategy um, or their national hydrogen strategy, they will need in the order of 3 million tons of hydrogen per year from 2030, but they're only able to generate slightly more than 10% of that volume in country. Japan, by contrast, 
is planning to import 300,000 tons of green hydrogen from 2030, but at a target price of three US dollars per kilogram landed in Japan, which means that the carrier costs, the transport costs, and the conversion costs must all be included. By 2040, the expectations for hydrogen to be carbon free, and by 2050, the volumes are expected to increase between five and 10 million tons per year, with the price hopefully having dropped to two US dollars a kilogram. Now, before we ask and explore, can South Africa be competitive? We first need to nail down some basics. We need to understand the difference between electrolyzer differences before the audience gets uh, very excited by my responses. I need to justify why I say them. The data which we present here, as you can see, has been published in the International Journal of Hydrogen. There are three electrolyzer technologies of interest. Alkaline electrolyzer um, uh, uh, cells, which is in the left column. Proton exchange membrane cells, which is in the central column. And solid oxide electrolyzer cells on the right-hand column. It's horses for courses. You have electrolyzers, the two food that are well placed for certain particular applications. Alkaline electrolyzers have been with us for the longest time. They have the lowest capital costs and currently operate at the highest efficiency. You can see in the, in, in the images, the lines small and large. The efficiency and the capital cost is a function of electrolyzer size where the small range is in the order of one megawatt and the large range is in the 20 megawatt and larger. You can see that there's not great agreement between all the different authors about uh, what agrees the, the CapEx trajectory between current and 2050. Um, but the, uh, the black solid lines represent the International Energy Agency um, uh, a view, which can be seen as some attempt, as a synopsis, as a, a review amount of all the published data. Alkali electron cells operate at low pressure, so, um, so they are not ideal for if you're going to be using it for electromobility and for, for, for mobility applications where you need high pressure storage and tanks. Proton exchange membranes operate very operate very well in response to changing electrical supply. They are slightly less efficient than alkali cells and noticeably more expensive currently. They can generate at significantly higher pressure, so are well aligned to mobility applications. Solid oxide electrolyzer cells are the most expensive. They're also the most efficient. They are of particular interest because they can co-electrolyze steam, not liquid water, and carbon dioxide, so they can produce um, uh, synthesis gas for the making of hydrocarbons. Why did I say all that? Well, in understanding where, where South Africa is competitive, we have completely recalculated the work that we had done in the previous um, uh, webinar. And for islanded renewable energy power. That is to say, if no electricity can come in or out of the system. For islanded renewable power, hydrogen can be generated at lowest cost using the following options. At large scale, 20 megawatts and larger, using hybrid renewable electricity, both PV and wind. And when we say PV, we're talking about single axis tracking, not stationary. This gives better cost uh, overall than PV or wind alone, or when the wind capacity is double that of the, the solar capacity. For the electrolyzer technology, lowest cost is achieved with alkaline. For shipping to foreign uh, uh, off-takers, being the EU or Japan, it is done at lowest cost when it is shipped as ammonia compared to liquid hydrogen or liquid organic hydrogen carriers. The cost once reconverted to gas at the other side, South Africa can meet Japan's cost target of three US dollars a kilogram, which can also be interpreted as 2.5 euro per kilogram before 2030, but assuming a weighted average cost of capital of 3%. Now that obviously is significantly concessional financing. 
in the absence of such financing, if the hydrogen is left as ammonia and not reconverted, the cost target may be met by 2030 at 6% weight. The cost target may be seen as the, the red line on the three graphs. The three graphs represent the three weighted average cost of capital ranges and the different technologies of hydrogen generation and conversion and storage, showing the lowest cost achievable with alkaline and with ammonia as a vector. Now, having said that, and before we go into the various uh, different offtake possibilities, we'd like to give the opinions of the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking, being one of two hydrogen bodies within the European Union that the EU delegation was keen on us consulting to get the latest information on how other ports are decarbonizing and using hydrogen. The first point is the Global Ports Coalition, developed under the Hydrogen Initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial of the EU. South Africa, particularly Soldana Bay and Ruha, are strongly encouraged to join the Global Ports Coalition. Port decarbonization is a global challenge. It's going to need uh, collaboration between different ports to get it right. And different ports can show the problems that they've encountered. Rotterdam, particularly, is very advanced. And they're very keen to share advice in how to move forward. The second issue, and possibly quite a contentious one, is what is the most suitable sustainable bunker fuel, fuel for maritime shipping? There's considerable debate about this in Europe. Less controversy for inland waterways, for that uh, barges, essentially, these consensus that pure hydrogen is uh, appropriate and an entirely um, uh, a useful answer. But for the open seas, it's really a competition between ammonia, which gives no CO2, and methanol, uh, which does, but is easier to handle. Maersk, at the moment, the, the, the global shipping uh, company, prefer methanol, but they've not yet taken the final decision. What complicates matters is that the EU road transport compliance yardstick for emissions is tailpipe emissions, not life cycle analysis. Now, will legislators accept the non-zero tailpipe emissions from the use of methanol? This is not clear. In addition to that, we have the EU carbon border adjustment mechanism, also known as the border adjustment taxes, which are under negotiation. Carbon-based fuel entering European waters or airspace um, may be subject to taxation. That will penalize methanol. The European Union emissions trading uh, scheme details are unclear. Will aviation and shipping be part of the ETS? If so, who's going to pay? The producer, the consumer, both? And will CO2 and which CO2 from outside C um, Europe will be taxed? So in the end, the ammonia and methanol issue is going to come down to legislation. But even then, ammonia will be some way off. The estimate is that's between four and five years away from an ammonia maritime combustion engine or fuel cell. The third issue is decarbonizing port operations. By port operations, we're talking about that equipment which loads and offloads cargo, um, interfaces with the vessels, and so on. Currently, almost exclusively, you're running on diesel. Electrification is one option. The Long Beach, California, has fully electrified its container terminal. But direct electrification is not really on the cards for many other ports. And the reason for that is the additional costs of the heavy power cabling required and that the batteries don't have the endurance required. The alternative direct electrification is hydrogen. And this is considered an ideal fuel for heavy duty operations. The port of Valencia in Spain will be the first port in Europe to use hydrogen uh, in uh, port decarbonization, where hydrogen fuel cells will power three elements, a reach stacker for the loading and unloading and transporting of containers, a terminal tractor, uh, tractor head for roll-on roll-off operations, and a mobile hydrogen supply station. The port of Antwerp is taking a slightly different view, where they're looking at the investigation of dual fuel operations, injecting hydrogen directly into diesel engines. The reason for this is there's not yet a good uh, hydrogen supply chain. 
and it enables the port to keep operating on diesel if the hydrogen supply is interrupted. There are three steps envisaged. The first is to allow the port staff to become acquainted with hydrogen by this dual fuel approach, ejecting hydrogen into the diesel. The second step is removing the diesel and having hydrogen only combustion in the, uh, in the diesel engines. The level of NOx combustion, uh, production will be quite small. The final step is a move to fuel cells. There's uncertainty, however. There's some hesitation about whether fuel cells are appropriate for the very heavy work. This is not resolved yet. Apart from container handling, uh, there are some pilot boats that are already using diesel blended with hydrogen. And this now introduces hydrogen into bunker fuels. The third use of hydrogen is the hotel load, the electrical demand of vessels which are moored stationary. It allows the engines, the, the, the engines of the vessel not to be engaged. And traditionally, it's done by um, uh, auxiliary power units on the quayside. So a fuel cell doing that means that you remove those emissions. Let's move to the real core of this presentation. The, um, the title of the presentation, the nearby off-takers, which would be possibly um, uh, affected by the availability of a large-scale hydrogen supply. We're looking at the area within 150 kilometers of Sildana Bay and within a 50 kilometers of Mulha. Close to Sildana Bay, we have the port of Sildana Bay and the port of Cape Town. So there are two ports. And at each port, you will have maritime shipping bunker fuel, where we envisage moving from heavy fuel oil to ammonia, and the equipment where we move there on the shore side, moving from diesel to fuel cells. We have AXA, which operates airports, looking at the Cape Town International Airport, moving the ground vehicles. Then the city of Cape Town operates a bus rapid transit system called MyCity. Um, and the city of Cape Town was interested in introducing a fuel cell pilot. So we as CSR cannot claim um, uh, uh, that idea. That's completely city of Cape Town's idea. We just expanded to say what happens if you replace the entire bus fleet. And the second area is that of the Metro Rail locomotives of Prosa. And um, it was city of Cape Town's idea to combat the persistent cable theft by switching towards fuel cells. Astron Energy Refinery, previously known as Calref, for the desulfurization of diesel, and ArcelorMittal, who, who own a steelworks in the area of Soldana, currently uh, mothballed. And there's a possibility of reducing iron ore with hydrogen instead of with uh, coking coal to produce green steel. Within a 50 kilometer radius of Gruja, the, um, the list is a bit shorter. Similar contents for the port of Gruja and Kabeja compared to Sildana Bay and Cape Town. Uh, similarly, ground vehicles at the Chief Darwin Steve Mine International Airport and Metro Rail locomotives uh, of Prasa in the city of Kabeja. Let's begin with Arcelor it's, uh, as I said, currently mothballed, and it could reopen, producing green steel dedicated for the European Union. ArcelorMittal is the largest steel producer in Africa, producing 7 million tons of steel per year. It supplies more than 60% of the steel used in South Africa. Soldano Works is largely focused on exports and is one of the five uh, uh, um, main operations of Amsterdam makes use of the Corex and Midrex technologies, as well as electric arc furnace. It produces hot briquetted iron, as well as direct reduced iron. The interesting thing about the Midrex technology is it can operate with 100% hydrogen, thereby completely sidestepping the requirement for carbon monoxide from uh, coking coal. And AMSA believes that to meet their maximum operational load, of um, um, 1,500 megatons per year of hot briquetted iron, they're going to need 104,000 tons of hydrogen per year. Going on to the MyCity bus rapid transport uh, bus network, they operate nine meter buses for suburban and inner city areas, high floor standard 12 meter and articulated 18 meter buses in dedicated busways, and finally, low floor standard 12 meter buses and 18 meter articulated buses for operation on the N2 express route. 
we obtained a data set from the city of Cape Town, which we're very grateful for, uh, for monthly kilometers traveled and diesel consumed. We used the 2019 data uh, for mileage because uh, the, they fluctuate a fair amount year to year, depending on uh, a number of, of, of parameters. But for fuel consumption, we averaged it over all the years for which we had data. Um, we anonymized the suppliers of the different buses. We believe that to be appropriate. Um, and in the end, we reach up on a number. I must point out that given a choice, battery electric vehicles remain preferable to fuel cell vehicles where the operations allow it. If you don't have range anxiety and if you have time to charge the batteries because they're cheaper and they're more efficient. If, however, you cannot uh, do your entire load on a, on a single charge and your time to charge is excessive compared to the operational demands, then we go to fuel cells. So if we assume the entire fleet moves toward fuel cells, we're gonna, if something in the order of 101 tons a month or 1.2 kilotons a year. Astron Energy, the, the uh, Kelref refinery, it's 100,000 barrels a day. The reason why any sulfur control is in place is because sulfur dioxide forms particulates and it forms smog in dense cities. This results in legislation to control sulfur content in fuel. South Africa tends to follow European standards as opposed to US or Japanese, despite the fact that our cities are smaller. Now, hydrogen is used together with a metal catalyst to remove sulfur in hydrosulfurization. Astron had invested 400 million rand in order to meet international maritime organization uh, deadline of the 1st of January, 2020, for refineries to reduce the sulfur content in marine fuels. Now, the South African legislation limits sulfur content in diesel only to 500 parts per million, nowhere near as stringent as in other parts of the world. The Euro 5 clean fuel is significantly more stringent than that. And it's considerably more stringent than the IMO marine fuel requirements. Now, increasing this fuel purity is going to require investment. In South Africa, the price of fuel is regulated, leaving the refineries in a difficult option with no way to recover those investments. Hence, the investments are not made. Now, crude oil varies in sulfur content dependent on where it comes from. The IMO 0.5% sulfur limit can be maintained largely just by choosing where you get your crude from rather than by additional activity. The rings and aromatics have higher octanes and you need platinum catalysts to make them. And Astron, in order to make the high octane gasoline for road transport, um, generates significant amount of hydrogen and this hydrogen is sufficient for their current desulfurization needs. So, long story short, in the near term, Astron is not really going to benefit from green hydrogen although they are monitoring the situation and with the onset and growth of carbon taxes, the parent company Glencore could well be interested. Looking at the transport, the transnet ports, um, the, um, the issues of marine fuels, there are four ports of interest, Soldana Bay, Cape Town, Kabeja, and Ruha. Now, with regard to the literature, there's a very nice piece of work done by Ricardo and the, the, um, the EDF. And they recommend hydrogen and ammonia for large commercial vessels, tankers, containers, bulk carriers, and so on. And they calculate that the fuel, the, the fuel demand is as listed on the slide there, 145 terawatt hours per year in total. And then they've got three case studies uh, giving 10 ter uh, 16, 10, and 27 terawatt hours for Soldana Bay, Bruja, and Richards Bay, respectively. There's no info on Cape Town or Kabeja, however, which is a bit difficult for us. Converted to ammonia, these figures then translate to 28 megatons uh, per year, and then three, two, and five megatons per year at the three ports, respectively. In our study, we took a more conservative approach. We decided to only evaluate those classes of cargo vessels for the adoption of sustainable fuels that meet three criteria. And the criteria are, one, that the market forces for that cargo and their supply chains will require decarbonization. Secondly, that the trade volumes of this will not decrease over time. So that puts 
fossil uh, fuels in, in jeopardy because uh, it's inconsistent with the, with the Paris future. And thirdly, that the classes make up a large fraction of bunker fuel by, of consumption by virtue of the vessel size and the distance to the destination port. So therefore, we don't consider fossil fuel carriers such as oil tankers, LPG tankers, and LNG tankers, because they're not subject to one and two. And we don't consider fishing vessels, tugboats, pleasure craft, yachts, and other private vessels, because they're not subject to one and three. This leaves us with bulk carriers, essentially all bulk carriers, not coal bulk carriers, and all carriers, container vessels and reefer vessels. Reefer vessels are vessels that carry refrigerated goods. Vehicle carriers and roll-on, roll-off vehicles, and finally general cargo vehicles. So in our approach, we bought data for port calls at the four ports, Soldana Bay, Cape Town, Grabecha, and Muha. And we chose it for the year 2018 as being the most recent year unaffected by COVID. For each port, we um, sorted the data by vessel type, considering only the vessel class that we mentioned. And for each departing voyage, we calculated the distance from the home port and the port of destination, every single voyage. And they are on, on, in the order of 700 voyages um, per port. The vessel cruising speed was assumed as a function of vessel class. We assumed 22 knots for high value items, container vessels, reefer vessels, vehicle carriers, and roro vessels, 14.75 knots for general cargo, and for bulk vessels and ore carriers, it's variable depending on the deadweight tonnage of the vessel. All this is explained in the report. The vessel engine power is proportional to the uh, density of seawater, the exposed surface area, S, as you see there, which in turn is a function of the draft of the vessel, which in turn is a function of the loading of the vessel, all of which is explained in the report, in the report and the cube of the vessel speed. And then there is a uh, C overall, we explain that in the report too. Long story short, at the four ports, we end up with annual volumes of ammonia in kilotons, and the hydrogen needed to make that ammonia is given in that table. Also looking at transnet ports, we looked at the port side equipment at the four ports. We approached Transnet National Ports Authority for the asset registers of the port side equipment, making use of a promotion of access to information act. It's fairly technical and fairly detailed uh, to, to, to submit. TNPA then forwarded this request to Transnet port terminals, um, who then are busy processing this request. Uh, they've told us this is not trivial, and the data requested at the date of this presentation has not yet been received by CSR. So we can't evaluate that at the, at the moment in time. In terms of airports company of South Africa, have a look at Cape Town International Airport, ground vehicles. Um, there are three companies that operate ground vehicles at both airports, Swissport, Bidair, and Menzies. All three companies provided the ground vehicle asset lists, which we're very grateful for. Company A provided the fuel and odometer logs, which was very helpful, and we were able to get good insight. Companies B and C provided an estimated diesel consumption. So as with the BRT analysis, the battery electric vehicle option is preferable if your range and your operation requirements allow it. I just need to stress that. Um, Company A that provided all the data that we required, we were able to convert that into hydrogen consumption. Company B and C, we um, made a few assumptions and got those numbers. And in the end, for all three companies, we end up with 55.8 tons per year. So it's a small volume compared to the other uh, sources. Thomas, can I ask you to bring your presentation uh, to a close shortly to hand over Absolutely. to Linda? Thank we'll, you. Okay. Then Chief David Stearman, the same three companies operate, but it's a much smaller airport and they tend to fill up with diesel offsite, which means they don't tend to have the consolidated data themselves only in their head offices, which is problematic. We now go over to the rail. So you came in dead right, Chris. I'm going to hand over to Linda now. Uh, thanks, Thomas. If I can get confirmation that uh, I'm audible and visible. 100%. Thank you, Linda. We can hear you and look forward to your part of the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Uh, as introduced, my name is Lindo, uh, also part of the CSR team, and I'd like to 
a bit welcome and uh, also to greet uh, everyone in, uh, present. I'll be taking you through the last portion of the presentation, um, which is based on the demand estimation of the Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa, uh, looking at the train service in Cape Town. So firstly, um, we look at the electric trains that are operational within the city. Uh, from the data that we received, uh, it can be inferred that there are 12 trains uh, that are operational, two of which uh, consist of um, uh, an, uh, an eight-car uh, train set, um, which uh, carries about 1,400 passengers and consists of two motor, uh, motor cars and, and six uh, plain uh, passenger cars. We also have three uh, 11 coach uh, train sets, uh, which each carries about 1,365 passengers and consists of three motor cars and eight passenger cars or plane cars. And then you also have um, about three, uh, what's called, three 12 coach trains. And this can carry about, uh, each train can carry about 3,200 passengers and it consists of three motor cars and nine plane cars. And of course it is assumed that uh, each train uh, carries about 60% of its passenger capacity uh, during uh, each trip. Now, in terms of estimating the uh, hydrogen demand uh, that can be derived from the, uh, from, the, uh, serv uh, from the train services that are within Cape Town, uh, it is proposed that these trains are replaced by a fuel cell powered train that uh, is similar to uh, the Coradia Island, which is a train that is designed and manufactured by the French company Alstom and was first tested in Berlin in Germany in 2016 and then later tested and used in other various countries such as France, uh, Poland, as well as Austria. Now the, spec uh, the specifications as well as the features of the train are as follows. Uh, the train has uh, two cars and has a passenger capacity of about 300 people. It, it has a hydrogen tank capacity of 188 kilograms. And from that, the efficiency of the train is given within a range of about 600 kilo, uh, kilometers to 1,000 kilometers per full tank uh, without having to refuel. The efficiency of the train is set at 0 0.52. And this is attributed by the uh, different components, uh, different uh, energy components uh, or energy processing components of the train which are the fuel cell, uh, which has an efficiency of about 60%, the uh, compensatory batteries, uh, lithium ion batteries that are also fitted in the train, which has um, an efficiency of about 90%, as well as the battery charger, which has efficiency of uh, 96%. All in all, that, equ uh, that equates to an efficiency of 0 0.52. And also here we assume that uh, each trip, uh, the train has about, uh, carries about 100% of its passenger capacity. Now, in terms of the data that was provided by Prasang uh, from the city of Cape Town, um, the data includes uh, the train routes and distances traveled to and from Cape Town in relation to the, uh, the nearby cities. Uh, additional data is also the number of trips and equivalent total distance covered by all trains in the given month for the 2012 to 2013 financial year. And also, the data provided was the annual electricity consumption by Prasa in Cape Town for the, uh, for the years between 2006 to 2011. Uh, next slide, please. All right, in terms of determining the uh, hydrogen estimation or yeah, the hydrogen demand estimation, the approach, followed is, uh, the approach followed was that the total distance covered by the electric trains um, was used to determine the hydrogen demand that would be needed by an equivalent fuel cell powered train uh, that can carry about the same number of passengers uh, within the same distances or for the same distances. Now, since the performance range uh, is given at 600 to 1,000 kilometers per uh, full tank of hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen demand estimates uh, uh, for the two extremes are, are determined. So one estimate for the 600 kilometer performance, uh, performance efficiency and one for the 1,000 kilometer performance efficiency. Now the estimated hydrogen demand and the equivalent energy is compared to the electricity demand uh, just for completeness to make sure that these values are within the same range. Now the assumptions followed. We assume that there's this, uh, we assume that they are, uh, the, the operational and performance condition, uh, conditions are the same. 
So that is to say that uh, the hydrogen fuel cell trains will be operating uh, within the same uh, uh, business operational hours as the electric trains. Uh, we'll transport the same number of passengers, we'll travel the same distances, uh, travel about the same speed, and et cetera. Now the electric train energy efficiency uh, uh, efficiencies uh, for that are assumed for the electric uh, trains are that the efficiency for the pentograph is about 99% and that of the uh, rectify is 95%. Uh, this ultimately leads to an overall efficiency of uh, 90 fuel cell trains, uh, the theoretical fuel cell trains uh, that would replace these uh, electric trains assume the technical properties of the Karadia Island train that was mentioned before. Uh, however, the sizes as well as the performance specs are increased to match uh, any sort of train that could transport the same number of passengers uh, you know, within the same number of uh, trips. And in terms of the uh, calculations for estimating hydrogen demand, uh, an, energy, an energy to mass ratio of hydrogen of about 32 point, sorry, 33.2 kilowatt hours to one kilograms of hydrogen is assumed. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the results obtained, the uh, monthly average uh, electricity demand uh, that was given uh, by Prasa for the electric trains is about 13.11 uh, gigawatts, uh, gigawatt hours. And when we equate this, or when we, uh, we find the equivalent uh, hydrogen mass for this, uh, it equates to about 394 tons, uh, or rather 95 tons of hydrogen. Now, in terms of uh, the estimates that are determined, uh, by the uh, number of trips as well as the distance traveled. Um, for a fuel cell train uh, with the performance of a uh, thousand kilometers per full tank of hydrogen, the energy demand, uh, uh, the, monthly average, uh, the monthly average energy demand is at 9.52 gigawatt hours. And that equates to about 551.31 tons of hydrogen. And if you assume the uh, efficiency, the performance efficiency is about 600 kilometers per full tank of hydrogen. The, uh, the, the monthly average is 15.86 uh, in terms of the energy demand, uh, that's in gigawatt hours. And we have uh, the equivalent hydrogen mass uh, at 918.85 tons. And of course, the annual uh, totals are given at, at, uh, at the bottom with the electrical demand for the electric trains uh, being at 157 gigawatt hours, which equates to 4,739 uh, tons of hydrogen. And for the fuel cell trains with the different efficiencies or performance efficiencies, we have 114 uh, gigawatt hours uh, per annum, which equates to 6.6 .6 kilotons of uh, hydrogen mass and 190 uh, gigawatt hours, which equates to about 11.02 or 03 kilotons of hydrogen. Next slide, please. Now, in this slide, we look at a comparison between the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen demand versus the actual demand uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was provided uh, in the data uh, provided by Prasa. Now, the solid lines or the solid graphs uh, those represent the uh, equivalent hydrogen mass in tons, and uh, the and the graph there is in relation to the axis on the left hand side. The dotted uh, the dotted graphs or the dashed graphs rather, these are the hydrogen demands uh, given in in uh, gigawatt hours, and the 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 scale therefore or the, rather uh, these graphs are, uh, are in relation to these. Uh, the axis on the right-hand side. Now, the green graphs at the bottom represent the hydrogen demand uh, for a very high efficient uh, fuel cell train, uh, the efficiency of the, uh, the 1,000 kilometers per full tank of hydrogen. And as can be seen, that this uh, pretty much averages, uh, averages at around nine gigawatt hours um, per month. And then the orange one, uh, the orange, uh, orange graphs at the top uh, represent for a less efficient um, fuel cell train, the efficiency being six, uh, the, the 600 kilometers per full tank. And that also averages around 15 gigawatt hours as seen in the previous slide. Now the graphs in between the blue and the, and the maroon, 
or red, depending on your perspective and I guess uh, your, how you interpret colors. Um, those uh, graphs represent the uh, electricity demand uh, uh, as provided by PRASA. Uh, and, as, and this is for the uh, 2010 to 2011 uh, financial year. And as can be seen here, that these uh, that uh, the graphs over there, they actually uh, lie a little bit closer to the upper limit. So for the less efficient case of a fuel cell train, um, and the two graphs, uh, the reason why there's a difference there is that the blue represents the the demand uh, that was given uh, by Prasa, and the red is the demand that has been corrected for any. Um, efficiency cases. Uh, this would be the efficiencies of the pentagraph and rectifier. So that shifts the graph a little bit, uh, a little bit below. But yeah. Sorry to chase um, you, um, Lindo, but can you please uh, bring your presentation to conclusion? We're running over time at the moment. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, as a matter of fact, this is the last slide that I wish to present. So I'll just hand back over to Thomas to give the concluding slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindo. We now have our final slide where we look at the summary of the possible uh, offtake volumes for Soldano Bay and Ruha. We've covered all the individual components. This table allows you to see the relative magnitude that the potential or of the potential offtakers. And as you can see, a hydrogen export supply at Soldano Bay and Ruha would assist in decarbonizing the hard to bait sectors in the two regions. And you can see that the bunker fuel and AMSA are very large comparatively speaking, and would require dedicated production capacity. Whereas the terrestrial transport, essentially metro rail, uh, the, the uh, MyCity bus network, and the port equipment, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the uh, 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 airport uh, uh, ground vehicles, they can be accommodated for in the regular production for export. And that brings us to our close. Well, thanks again, Thomas. Uh, it's been an interesting presentation and also to you, Lindo, for your uh, input uh, on, on the uh, rail sort of uh, applications. And uh, uh, it was great to have you, Thomas, at our first, uh, present the first uh, CSR study and Thomas and Lindo now at the second. So um, it's uh, now my pleasure now to um, move on and introduce you to our next speaker, uh, who is um, Kesh Mudeli. Uh, Kesh is from Boston Consulting Group, and let me uh, give you a little bit of background on him. So Kesh is a project leader at Boston Consulting Group's Johannesburg office. He started off his career as a mechanical engineer working on various power stations and industrial plants in South Africa. Today, Kesh is a lead member of Boston Consulting Group's energy practice, the hydrogen known for BCG, uh, node for BCG Africa, and he's led a number of projects focused on developing commercialization strategies for green hydrogen. So Kesh is also BCG's lead in the Climate Pathways and Just Transition Project, a national study being conducted in partnership with the National Business Initiative and the Business Unity South Africa BUSA to understand what it will take for South Africa to get to net zero. Kesh holds a BSc degree in mechanical engineering and an MSc in industrial engineering from Wits University. He also holds an MBA from INSEAD in France. So over to you now, Kesh, uh, with your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Maybe just a check. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yep. Thank Perfect. you. And welcome to everybody on the call. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take everyone through sort of a high level view of where we see sort of hydrogen going globally. We'll start from a bit of a macro international trend. And then we'll go into sort of what we think that means for South Africa and what we mean by this sort of green hydrogen opportunity that we, we all talk about, yeah? Um, so, so what's on screen at the moment is just a view of various different forms of hydrogen. So it's important to acknowledge, and I think the previous presenters covered that well as well, is that hydrogen is not a new sort of technology, yeah? It's been around for quite some time. Uh, it is primarily black and gray hydrogen that we use today. So um, black and gray hydrogen is effectively made from a non-renewable energy source, yeah? Uh, but it is highly carbon intensive in its production. Uh, then you get blue hydrogen, um, which is very much similar to black and gray in terms of its production methodology, but the CO2 from that production process is then captured and stored uh, through carbon capture uh, and storage technology. And then you've got green hydrogen, which is what we've been talking about today, which is a fundamentally different chemical process. Yeah? Uh, it is made through electrolysis as, as the previous presenters has uh, had, uh, explained, uh, but it's also important to understand the status quo as it is today, right? 
Uh, so hydrogen globally, as part of the energy mix, as we see it, is far less than a percentage um, point um, in terms of what it makes relative to coal, oil, and natural gas. So yes, there's huge potential as we go forward, but today, you know, there's still lots of work to do in order for us to overcome many of the challenges, particularly on price uh, and the, the so-called green premium uh, associated with green hydrogen, yeah? And just so everyone sort of understands this, the full value chain, I think I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I think uh, you know, we talk about blue, uh, black, gray, green hydrogen, there are many colors of hydrogen, yeah? So, so this slide gives you a view of the full value chain in the hydrogen space. Uh, the other colors we haven't mentioned before is turquoise hydrogen. Uh, so that is made through methane pyrolysis. Uh, orange hydrogen, which is a new color, uh, uh, made from the reforming of biogas and biomethane. Uh, and then uh, pink hydrogen, which is very much following the same production process as green hydrogen, but then using nuclear power as an energy source to that production process. Yeah. So all of that effectively results, depending on which color you choose here, a hydrogen molecule. The value chain then goes into conversion, uh, midstream assets, and then application in the downstream space. And I think uh, our colleagues from CSR did a great job of kind of going into the specific projects and end use cases that hydrogen could potentially play a role in in South Africa. But in terms of the value chain and where sort of uh, the value pools lie uh, from a commercial perspective, uh, there is value in the upstream in the production of the hydrogen molecule. There is value in the conversion and synthesis process uh, particularly in South Africa, when we think about sort of ammonia synthesis, methanol synthesis, and the fisher trops process, uh, which will get us to sustainable aviation fuel. And then in the midstream as well, so the, the actual uh, sort of midstream assets and infrastructure allowing the transportation of either hydrogen molecules or, or e-fuels uh, downstream to the application and endpoint sectors, right? So this is sort of the full scope. Later on in the presentation, we'll go through sort of how companies are playing out different strategic plays and commercial plays across the value chain as we see it today. But it's important that everybody's on the same page in terms of what this picture looks like. But we see four key sort of drivers of hydrogen in the long term, um, particularly starting on the left with the climate imperative. I think COP26 uh, this year was made it very clear uh, and probably one of those COPs where, um, you know, there were very few denialists in the room around uh, the imperative of uh, maintaining temperature rise well below two degrees Celsius. And hydrogen, as we know, is a critical enabler, particularly for hard to abate sectors uh, in terms of us achieving that objective, yeah? Um, but we also see improving economics. Um, I think in the previous presentation, again, we saw some really exciting sort of uh, cost profiles and where that could go to by 2030 for South Africa. And so what you see in the sort of second column here is a exponential sort of decay in cost when it comes to green hydrogen, particularly as we get to 2030. So very much that green premium that we see today uh, is very much being worked on through technology solutions, commercial solutions, and regulatory solutions, particularly on the finance side. Um, speaking of regulatory, I think climate policy is also playing a massive role in driving the, the growth for green hydrogen. Yeah? So lots of stimulus packages post COVID-19, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, but I think most recently, and something that we find very interesting is what's happening in the US right now, with over a trillion dollar sort of infrastructure bill spend uh, uh, being passed through the Senate, uh, about 700 billion of which has been ring fenced for climate uh, infrastructure spend as well. And with that subsidies, and we'll talk just now about what they're thinking about in terms of incentivizing uh, the demand side for hydrogen in the US and how that's structured. But with all of those key pillars in place, we do see massive potential for hydrogen in the future, right? Uh, by 2050, if we follow sort of a two degree path, uh, we get to about 350 million tons uh, today um, and over a trillion dollar uh, market opportunity by 2050. And that's only a two degree path. In a net zero path, it's actually more. So, so very fundamental drivers to, to sort of the green hydrogen trajectory we see globally. Um, at BCG, we've done quite a lot of modeling on, on what that could look like under various different scenarios. What's presented on the left is sort of a two degree path. I'm not gonna go through the details. I think uh, you will get the slides so you can go through the details of that as well. But the key point to make here is that, you know, this demand profile will vary per geography, per region, driven on regulatory changes, et cetera. Uh, and so we need to keep those kind of nuances in, in, in mind, but also at a sector level, right? Uh, and we see various sectors accounting for uh, more a share of hydrogen than others, particularly here aviation, given the hard to abate uh, nature of that sector, the role of sustainable aviation fuels, and then the linkage to green hydrogen production, but also other sectors, which the colleagues from CSR mentioned as well, around steel, petrochemicals, ammonia, methanol, et cetera lots of end use cases for hydrogen, uh, particularly once we reach that parity point. 
So I mentioned earlier, the US have passed this trillion dollar sort of um, infrastructure bill in, 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 in the Senate, or it's being discussed at the moment. One of the things that is being considered to get over this green premium is a hydrogen production tax credit. Now, the logic here is that the green premium is also one of the key reasons why there's a bit of a disparity between emerging markets and developed economies, right? Emerging markets can't afford it because it's more expensive than the status quo of today. And so they have to trade off emissions for socioeconomic growth. If we can circumvent this green premium, the point is you don't need to deal with that issue anymore. In the US, and it's not something we're saying is going to potentially work in SA, but it's a good sort of view of what's the art of the possible. In the US, they're tackling this challenge by a, a production tax credit of about $3 per kg. How you read the graph on this page is you've got three time horizons, 2021 till 2030. In green is the levelized cost of hydrogen through for green hydrogen uh, production. In blue, it's for blue hydrogen production. In gray, it's for gray hydrogen production. And then in dark gray, it's natural gas. Yeah, And, and you'll see the sort of dotted line, the effect that that has, i.e. the production tax credit, the effect that it has relative to the LCOH of green hydrogen. And what it means is that already in 2021, from a demand side point of view in the US, you will see green hydrogen reach parity with gray alternatives, right? So massive subsidizations. The point, the thinking here is that this will last up to about 2027 or so and then fall off. You'll see in 2030, it actually goes negative because, you know, that's the, the result of the hydrogen learning rate coming down over time. But I think, you know, these sort of regulatory levers are things we just need to keep uh, on the radar as a signpost, particularly when we're looking at the export market and where we think we can, can be competitive versus where we can't. Yeah? So that's a bit of a view of the, of the global landscape and, and how that's playing out. I think the important thing is to double down and say, well, what does that mean for South Africa? And why do we think this is an opportunity for SA? Yeah? And so fundamentally, we see this built on three key pillars of, of structural competitive advantage. I think number one is um, large scale, high quality renewable energy potential. And I think quantifying that, I mean, the CSIR has done a great job also at looking at sort of our renewable energy development zones and what average load factors we could get from there. Load factor, of course, is a, a contributor to lower levelized costs of hydrogen. So with relatively high load factors in the renewable energy space, basically means South Africa can compete globally uh, when it comes to a, a competitive LCOH. When we've done our modeling, we see even when you convert to green hydrogen, similar to what <coughs> the CSIR mentioned, uh, we can be competitive relative to other players. The other, the other key advantage here is going to be the availability of land. South Africa in our renewable energy development zones alone have about 5.35 million hectares of, of land available, of high quality renewable energy land available. And that means if we are to achieve a 10 million ton production capacity in South Africa by 2050, we only would need, <coughs> excuse me, got a bug in my throat we would only need 1.1 million hectares of that land. So a big competitive advantage when you consider that relative to, for example, Europe, right? And a massive synergy also with water security. So the interesting thing when it comes to water, we, we may look at it and say, well, South Africa is a water scarce country, which is correct. Um, but when you look at desalination costs and the amortization of desalination infrastructure into the levelized cost of hydrogen, it's negligible. It's less than a US cent per kg. So there's a big synergy here for solving for water security while still capturing the green hydrogen opportunity for South Africa. And then lastly, leveraging our unique technology advantage and asset advantage when it comes to existing fisher trops technologies and assets on the ground today uh, to hit that market first and really exploit uh, a first mover advantage in the space. And this is sort of at a national level, but also as we look to export that technology globally. <coughs> So, so that's sort of where, why we think we have a structural advantage. Now, where is the demand going to come from? I, I think Chris mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the export market is important, but also the local market is just as key. So if we look at sort of some of the local levers for driving demand for green hydrogen, we think particularly in the industry space, um, and the way to read this graph, by, uh, uh, by the way, is to look at sort of the industry uh, end, end points on the left, the mode of hydrogen sort of usage under the application. So either it's raw hydrogen, it's ammonia, it's methanol, or it's some form of hydrocarbon derived from green hydrogen. Uh, and then we also list the alternatives here. The green ticks are basically where we see uh, hydrogen being competitive in the long term, uh, and question marks as to where we've got a bit of uncertainty and crosses where we think you know the alternatives will effectively win out. But in industry, given the particularly in the hard to abate sectors and in the production of ammonia and methanol, we think that green hydrogen will be competitive in the long term and will play a key role there. 
in mobility. Um, also uh, conclude with the fact that heavy, heavy road vehicles, off-highway vehicles, under the right operating conditions, will win out against BEVs. It's not a, a kind of um, absolute statement, though. There will be a share of BEVs and a share of hydrogen electric vehicles, particularly when we think about this from an end-to-end -end value chain perspective in South Africa and the availability of platinum group metals and the benef local beneficiation of that for fuel cell manufacturing in South Africa. So there's a bit of a broader value chain play uh, in that mobility space that we, we also need to take into account. And in power, uh, not so much in terms of the role of green hydrogen, at least in the short term, maybe in the long term for longer term duration storage, sort of post 2035, 2038 or so, hydrogen could play a role there. Uh, but in the short, in sort of short to midterm, it could potentially play a more significant role in uh, very high uh, value um, decentralized energy examples. Yeah? For, for example, uh, data centers where the cost of redundancy uh, is really high and the, the premium required for that green hydrogen to play a role in long duration storage could make sense. So there we see it potentially playing a role as well. And so based on all of that modeling we've done on a sort of use case by use case basis, looking at South Africa, and we're starting off here with an ambitious sort of 2050 view, we see demand reaching sort of three to six million tons by 2050, uh, driven a bit by the mobility sector, but very much by industry, as you can see on this graph. And as I mentioned, as you get to 2040, uh, the power sector, particularly for that last mile, long intermittency, long duration storage uh, synergy that hydrogen has in the power system. And then of course, export. So what we did from an export point of view was saying, look, the global hydrogen market in a net zero scenario is about 500 million tons. The X under that scenario, uh, if you look at the EU and Japan alone, the import requirements are somewhere around 30 million tons. And if South Africa are able to capture 10% of that, we get to about 3 million tons of export demand. So somewhere between three and 6 million tons of demand by 2050, right? And on the right-hand side, you'll see a sort of future view of you know, what those demand nodes could look like. Um, this is not, this is basically based on the same economic structure that we have today. You'll see Bukhubai, for example, in the Northern Cape, not particularly mentioned on this chart, but very much could, could come into play as we move forward uh, in this hydrogen journey. But the interesting thing, once you look at the demand side is also to consider the supply side, right? And so the graph on the left gives you a view of what a, what a theoretical sort of hydrogen, national hydrogen supply picture could look like with various strategically located hydrogen supply hubs, right? You'll see Bukubai up there, Saldana up there, Kucha as well, that the colleagues have, have spoken about before, and some internal uh, hydrogen production nodes as well. Uh, the numbers that you see on the left are the equivalent renewable energy and electrolyzer capacity that you would need to meet that demand. It doesn't say, it doesn't mean all of that needs to be in Kauteng and Pumalanga, for example. That is very much a demand side view equated into renewables and electrolyzer capacity. But the key thing here is if you look at the right-hand side, um, to get to three, six million tons of, of demand, uh, uh, i.e. to meet six million tons of demand by 2050, and to scale up production to do that, we need 130 gigawatts, more or less, of dedicated renewable energy capacity, 57 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity, um, 54 gigaliters of, of water, massive amounts of water, right? Um, but to put it into perspective again, that's about 20% of ESCOM's coal-fired power stations consumption today. But, but we don't see that water being recycled into, into the hydrogen production space. We see more or less desalination playing a better role there to enable that water requirement. And then land. And, we, and, and for now, the boundary condition of our approach is to leverage our renewable energy development zones to circumvent any issues around land availability, et cetera. So, so the critical point here is uh, scale is massive. To build 130 gigawatts of wind and solar till 2050 means we need to build three to four gigawatts a year every year for the next 30 years, right? We've done four gigawatts in the last 10 years in South Africa. So building the capacity, the capability, the skill sets, and the speed to actually realize this opportunity in South Africa is going to be critical. Without that, um, you know, we're not going to capture full value from this play. And so just to add a bit to the complexity of this, you know, there are different configurations. If you think about that national picture that I just saw, showed with the various different hydrogen supply demand nodes, right? you could have an archetype, um, just basically a mode of, uh, of setting up your, your, your supply demands um, a configuration where your renewable energy, your electrolyzer, and all of your midstream infrastructure and your demand nodes are within 100 kilometers of each other. And so we call that a co-located archetype. You could have another archetype where you say, well, look where my demand nodes are, I don't have really good renewable energy load factors. So I wanna take my renewable energy and my electrolyzers and place them at the best point of, of load factor. 
and then transport the hydrogen molecule in, so pipe the hydrogen molecule in uh, to our endpoints of demand. That's archetype two. And then you've got archetype three, which is saying, well, instead of putting my electrolyzer where my renewable energy is, which is the best point of load factor, let me co-locate that with my demand, right? And then send an electron over the grid. Now, thermodynamically, that's not the most efficient way to do it, especially if you think about intermittency and the ability to manage intermittency. You're much better doing that in a pipeline than in a, in a, in a grid, but where there is existing infrastructure that can be leveraged, um, that could potentially play a role. The point is, there's lots of complexity in this. There's also sub levels of complexity around what's the right electrolyzer choice that we make, et cetera. And so the optimal configuration at a national level is gonna be key for us to, as a country, build a sustainable long-term competitive advantage. And that's gonna take a nationally coordinated approach. It's not gonna happen naturally, right? So a strategic alignment of supply demand hubs, looking at where demand hubs could evolve, where it could break even, uh, and also where the best sources of supply are and what are the midstream infrastructure that's required will be critical. And I think the work being done now by the hydrogen panel to try and paint that picture is, is, is a step in the right direction there. Uh, but localization where we have a sustainable competitive advantage is also just as important. Um, setting up this hydrogen economy but not having any beneficiation or manufacturing uh, happening in South Africa will not allow us to actually achieve a just transition. Um, we actually need to make sure that that localization happens, but not in, a, in an unconstrained manner, right? Like we're never going to be competitive in the value chain. If we think back a few slides, we're never going to be competitive on producing PV panels, for example. You know, the Chinese and uh, the manufacturing capability and scale that they have is just so much that it's, it's not worth us trying on that space. But in other components of the value chain, definitely there's, there's opportunity and figuring out where to play and how we can win in that value chain is going to be critical. And then lastly, enabling policy and regulation. So things around carbon border tax adjustments, how that plays out over time, uh, what are the carbon accounting methods in terms of what we count as a green H2 molecule versus what we don't, um, tax credits, um, shared infrastructure investments, all of that needs to be done in a coherent aligned way, expanding across the hydrogen value chain in order for us to make all of this work correctly. And so lots of complexity to deal with from an implementation perspective, but even more so when we think about a coordination perspective and that national approach uh, is critical for us to, to really build a sustainable competitive advantage here. As I mentioned, the socioeconomic value is huge. Uh, we're still modeling out what that could mean from a downstream hydrogen sector perspective, but just on the renewable energy component alone, we think about 1.8 million jobs could be created. Uh, we see lots of projects already on the ground today, uh, various different sectors, various different companies and players uh, participating in the space. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of this again, you'll get the slides, but I think just one important point to mention here is there are different strategic plays evolving across the value chain, right? The way to read this is you've got equipment-centric players, so technology OEMs in the first line, service-centric players, so engineering service providers in the second line, and then asset-centric players who actually own the assets and play across the value chain. And so companies are really thinking about this strategically to think, what is the best strategic play for me? Where do I have the right to win? And we see various examples of that playing out across the globe with various different companies. The point is, from a commercial perspective, we need to figure out where to play, how to win, and what's the right strategic play uh, for South Africa and for our commercial sector. And lastly, just I mentioned the point about regulation. Finance is going to be just as key. Um, uh, the colleagues from CSR mentioned earlier, we're competitive at a 3% WAC. We need to, to figure out how to get more concessional debt financing or grant financing into our financing landscape for us to be competitive as a nation. Both if you're thinking about corporate balance sheet financing and project SPV financing, grant funding must play a key role. The same thing that we see happening in Europe, North America, Canada, where it's between 10 and 25%. And for us to really kind of capture this opportunity, making sure we can um, sort of from a terms of finance perspective, achieve that concessional grant funding will be critical. So I'm going to leave it there. I see Chris is coming on video, so I'm probably out of time. Uh, and I'll, I mean, it, uh, what you see on the slide is basically a summary of what I just took you through. But hopefully that was interesting and uh, looking forward to some Q&A later. As well. uh, thanks so much, Kesh. Uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, all these slides will be shared with you afterwards uh, within a couple of days uh, after this event. Uh, so you will get all the details that you may have missed uh, along the way. So it's my uh, pleasure to thank Kesh for a really great presentation, clear, well presented, uh, and with a lot to think about, and, and of course, a lot to still study when we get the presentations. Uh, thanks very much, Kesh, for your input. Uh, I'm now going to call a, 
uh, a 10 minute uh, a comfort break. Ladies and gents, we are running a little over time and I must apologize for that. Uh, but I do think we need to stretch our legs. It's been quite a long haul. So we're going to call it a, 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 a break now and reconvene at 13.35. 13.35. That's just a little over 10 minutes. Gives you an opportunity to grab a cup of tea or something, um, a comfort break. And we will see you then back at 13.25, where I can tell you we've got some really great presentations coming up. And it's going to move from maybe the study and the theoretical side to really the practical side of what is actually being done, not only in South Africa, in the mining industry, but around the world, uh, where we can see some real tangible progress uh, in this uh, green hydrogen sector. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Devon uh, Haver uh, from Plug Power, who's going to really show us what is happening around the world and in South Africa. And then lastly, uh, by uh, Royal Hasconing, uh, DHV, um, uh, Piyush Katawak, and uh, Philip Koenig are going to speak to us uh, as well. So some great presentations coming up where we really get hands on and looking forward to seeing you then at uh, 13.35 when we'll reconvene. Thank you, ladies and gents. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. It's exactly 13.35 and we're due to start now the next session. Uh, and to do this, uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Devon Haver from Plug Power. Uh, Devon, uh, from September 2020, Devon has been uh, Plug Power's sales and marketing director for mobility and electrolyzer solutions for the Europe, Middle East, and Africa regions. Uh, before this, he was the national accounts sales director at Plug Power for France. Italy and the Iberian, Benelux, and Nordic regions. And before this, he held multiple positions at ABB since 2008, rising to product marketing director for electrification installation products. Devon has MBA degrees from La Sorbonne in France and HEC Montreal in Canada, as well as other technical and marketing qualifications. So, Devon, we can see your presentation, but could you put it into presentation mode? That's perfect. We can see your presentation. Over to you. All good. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Chris, for the introduction, and thank you to the previous uh, panelists. It was very exciting to see uh, all this exciting moment around the green hydrogen in uh, South Africa. So, uh, I'm Devon Aver from Plug Power, and also working very closely in uh, South Africa with Carl Smith, sales director for SmallCheck. Um, plug power, we are in the hydrogen business since more than uh, 20 years. Since 1997, doing pen fuel cell mostly. Uh, in 2008, we started to deploy in captive fleet with our customers, uh, pen fuel cell, mostly in material handling and ground spot equipment. So today, we have more than 180 side running with our system, 52,000 fuel cell deployed on the field. Um, 40 side with Walmart, 50 with Amazon, Ikea, BMW, all these guys. And then in 2020, following the pressure that our customer was pushing to get access to green hydrogen, we decided to acquire Gainer ELX for their state-of-the-art PAM technology, uh, and then also United Hydrogen for their liquefaction capabilities. In the meantime, we were building a 2.5 gigawatt factory in Rochester uh, in the US to expand our production of stack and uh, fuel cell PAM, obviously. We have two strong joint venture in Europe with Renault to build commercial vans and minibuses, with Asiona in Spain to produce green hydrogen, and we have one, uh, another one in South Korea with uh, SK Group to be present on the local green energy market. The latest news around plug power electrolyzer activity, probably some of you have seen this exciting news this morning. Plug power have been awarded for a 100 megawatt green ammonia project by 30 global CI company uh, to produce green ammonia using green energy in Egypt. And uh, we will be delivering the product for the COP27 next year in Egypt. So that's really exciting. We have also strong European partnership for one gigawatt, 300 megawatt, an offshore application. We are starting to deploy in 2022. We announced two new factories to produce stack 
um, one in Australia for two gigawatt and one in Korea for one gigawatt. We announced the acquisition of ACT. It was finalized last night. So it's applied cryo technology and also frames engineering. And I will develop a bit more about frames engineering. During the symposium, we presented our new stack, the dry build with 50% higher density and 50% higher efficiency, allowing you to use less power to produce more hydrogen. And finally, we have the completely ready to go 100 megawatt design that is approved for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and India. So we're really exciting about this one. So we are working to acquire, it will still be finished before the end of this year, and it's uh, publicly known and announced, uh, the Frames company. We are working together because they are able to produce the best of the best uh, uh, skid solution, balance of plant around our PEM stack. So we have the best PEM stack and we have the best uh, balance of plants. And now we are able to deliver to the market uh, complete chunky technology. So it's 300 engineers now with that will be working 100% on electrolyzer and green hydrogen production all over the world. We have offices in Netherlands, in Europe, in India, in Dubai, and their strategy is to do all the design within frame, but then the supply chain and the fabric at the shop is doing local basis. So any project we'll have in South Africa, in the uh, Middle East, or in anywhere in Africa, we can subcontract the complete assembly and the production of the scheme around our stack and around our design and also the supply chain. So the dc, -DC cable, transformer, rectifier, um, we do that to create some value, not only within the power, but also on the local market. We think it's very important to transmit some knowledge and to have the market growing from outside, but also from inside to imply people in the strategy to move to green hydrogen. Complete chunky solution from black power. So, we are the only one company that is a pure player in green hydrogen able to offer everything from the H2 generation with our electrolyzer, the liquefaction capabilities, the logistic, and the fuel cell that the customer are using in the equipment. So as you can see on the uh, bottom page, we take the power, wine, PV, battery, coming from SCOM as well. We put it in the electrolyzer up to gigawatt scale. We produce the hydrogen directly at 40 bar output. We store the hydrogen as a we inject it in the process. So we have seen multiple uh, potential customers that use hydrogen in the process uh, that cash was present, presenting, Sasso, Total, all the chemical and refinery. Or we compress this hydrogen at 350 bar or 700 bar, and we can inject all the different mobility vehicles that you are able to get in different application, airport, mining, uh, transport of goods, where it makes a lot of sense to have uh, fuel cell electric vehicle. The car mystery, everyone, today, that's not the best solution in my uh, point of view. Taxis that you are using a lot, 24-7, yes, you can go with hydrogen. So we are also doing genset, one megawatt by one megawatt block. It can help in some uh, areas where you need backup power, using hydrogen itself, using diesel, it will help to reduce your CO2 emission uh, for isolated or out of the grid sites. Trial engine for mobility. So as I mentioned, we have a strong partnership with Renault where we are building all kinds of vans up to 3.5 tons, refueling station, mini buses, garbage truck. And also we are working with different other company on other project for buses, long old truck, mining operation. So that's very exciting to see or we are able to cover the complete body chain, having the fuel cell inside the vehicle, the infrastructure and the hydrogen produced locally to be able to decarbonize the complete uh, application. In terms of electrolyzer, multiple different market, as you know. So we have the gas to power or power to power, the P2N, where we are very present because we are able to supply the fuel cell as well as the electrolyzer. And then the PITOX, that's the largest market growing at the moment. Ammonia, steel, chemical, where you are seeing a lot of potential for the green hydrogen market to decarbonize the assets. So <coughs> in the ammonia plant, in refinery, in methanol, in petrol, you will have very large project and hydrogen will be used to produce the ammonia molecule. And then we are seeing a lot of traction for the export of ammonia. And as you know, 
in South Africa, you are in good space of God. You have a lot of sun and a lot of wind, as well as a lot of land available. So for you, it will be uh, a key in the future uh, to use ammonia to export the green molecule to different other country possible when your local usage will be complete. We have steel factories. As you know, steel factories are, uh, are emitting 7% of the total CO2 emission global. So that's really important that they start to use hydrogen as soon as possible in their BFR route or in a ERI route. Uh, we are working with some of them. It's only at uh, analysis or feed study for the moment, but we are seeing a lot of traction from these guys. Uh, you mentioned different uh, potential steel factory in the, present, in the previous presentation. So absolutely. And we dare to support all the activity with a state of the art uh, electrolyzer with a small footprint. Finally, using hydrogen for the mobility sector. And you currently have some application in South Africa where Pratt Power is participating. Uh, perhaps some of you have heard about the Anglo-American project where they have the strategy to power a mining truck. So Pratt Power we present in this application uh, to uh, get hydrogen within the, the truck, the fuel cell powered truck. So what we were able to work uh, in the previous years is exactly what you are seeing on the screen uh, at a design level. So the compressor, gate storage, the complete manifold, nitrogen sources, and the dispensers. So the infrastructure coming from Plug Power in uh, working in collaboration with Anglo and NG. And then that's what we have on site now. So the site, uh, the pictures have been taken two or three weeks ago. Everything is being uh, build at the moment, and uh, we will be very short to uh, commission everything in South African land. So you see the refueling station for this big uh, engine. Um, you see the complete skid over there, high pressure, the skid again and being worked. So we have work at Plug Power, and we have worked with local company, uh, such as a small check technology to supply all the, the services over there, uh, the commissioning and the support to the local team who don't have uh, knowledge. So we train, we work together, and I think it's how you are able to be successful on local land. Um, then we have the power to power application using hydrogen to re-inject hydrogen in uh, genset uh, to be able to produce power when you are out of the grid. So during the day or during uh, 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 off moment of peak, you produce hydrogen, you store it, and when you are at peak demand, instead of using diesel generator, you will be able to use hydrogen in your product. So plug power, we are doing PEM stack uh, since more than 40 years. The US uh, Navy is using our stack in the submarine. Uh, the NASA International Space Station is using our product because of the high safety we're able to provide. And um, we have the smaller space versus the competition, fastest ramp rate. So that's a perfect application where you are working in combination with renewable soft power, or intermittent soft power. And finally, we have the largest MEA and we have the largest factory to produce PEM, fuel cell, and PEM stack to deliver to the market. So what we are doing, we take a product that was completely tailor-made, we industrialize the process, completely optimize the process, and now we are delivering at very high scale this one megawatt stack that you are seeing here. We call them the Alagash. So the Alagash stack allow you to have exactly the same performances at what we were able to get uh, with a standard pen stack on the market. But we are able to operate uh, with very high temperature, allowing us to have the highest Q and density operation on the market with three ends per centimeter square, targeting five ends for next year. And uh, we are able to get the highest operating pressure without any compression. No compression, but a direct output at 40 bar. So it told you to save a lot on the capex and the opex, as well as increase the reliability of your overall installation because compression, as you know, in all the gas uh, market is the most, uh, the less reliable equipment that you will get. Um, so it's key for us to offer a very high reliability for our customers. Some example of our production, one megawatt standard system, so we produce them 10 by 10, as you can see there, all the one megawatt that I get stack, the complete balance of plant, the deoxyl. We put them, we put them in the container and we ship them to our customer sites. 
Then we have different uh, options we can work on. We have EVAP cooler for very hot environments in Middle East, in uh, North Africa, uh, in New Mexico, in Texas. We have standard product where we are able to fit everything in a 40 foot container. And also, as you know, plug power is starting to deploy offshore electrolyzer. So we put one megawatt electrolyzer on the board and we put them offshore for different application. This solution could be a major success for uh, South Africa having such a long uh, coastline. Then we have the five megawatt module, exactly the same application. We use five times one megawatt stack, but one on Libanex of plant. In terms of efficiency, in terms of capex, it's much more uh, interesting to use such solution. So we use this, we put everything in a 40 foot container and we deliver to our customers. So this container assembly is something that we can do on local basis on the project we are working with. What we do, we qualified some local subcontractor able to complete skid assembly, and they do the skid assembly according to our design, and we ship complete black box. So a turnkey solution to our customer. You have the transformer, the rectifier, the complete electrolyzer container, and then you can add some dry cooler. If you are already working, in a brownfield factory where there is cooling water available, we can take out the dry cooler and directly use the cooling water from the factory. Finally, as I mentioned, we have the 100 megawatt design that will be the first one uh, ever deployed uh, in Africa will be in Egypt next year in 2022 with OCI 30GOB uh, green ammonia plant. So it's a 100 megawatt module instead of using five megawatt module, we are using 10 megawatt module multiplied by 10. So we have 10 of them inside the system, the complete uh, plate extender there. You have the electrolyzer, we put all the rectifier transformer, cooling pump skid, water treatment, water storage, and H2 purification to deliver to the, uh, to the fuel cell mostly. So in 3000 square meter, you are able to get 100 megawatt of electrolyzer of 40 tons per day produce of green hydrogen if you are using a renewable source of power. So that's really exciting. And it means that it's not accessible only for all the greenfield projects that we will see in five, six years, but you can stop today with the company that are emitting a lot of CO2 to, to try to decarbonize uh, their application, especially the big chemical ammonia plant using SMR or using coal power plants uh, to produce the energy. 15 ton per day building blocks for the liquefaction is something that we are seeing more and more, especially around the aviation and the marine industry. They all want to refuel direct hydrogen and liquid uh, stage inside the big boat or inside the airplane. As you know, Plug Power have a different partnership with airplane company, with Airbus, uh, where we are building the first ever green airport in Texas using hydrogen, and also with different other company to help them to put fuel cell in airplane to power them. So in such case, it could be interesting. Value proposition from plug power, complete scalable turnkey system, super European technology, as you know, manufacturing at scale and the capabilities to produce on local and a strong financial partner uh, with our $5 billion cash flow available to deploy green hydrogen project. That's really exciting. And we are not here to wait for the subsidies from the government. And we are not here to wait for the planet to continue to uh, have more CO2 emitted, but we are here to act. And it's what you have been able to see with plug power. Different project all over the world. In the mobility sector, we are very present. Uh, we have been able to deploy also in uh, very hot environment where we put some redundancy module uh, because of the customer need and it's off the grid sites. We have a lot of project where the strength of plug power producing the hydrogen at 40 bar directly is very interesting for different uh, company industrial usage in refinery ammonia plants uh, where they inject directly the hydrogen in the process. Same in factory, waste management incinerator, large boiler. Then, as I mentioned, Black Power, we are doing hydrogen, we are doing a lot of equipment, but also we need the best of the best equipment for our home plant. 
we are producing ourselves green hydrogen in the US because we were not able to find any. So as you can see on the map, all the little green points are plants that we have, this captive fleet uh, that are using between uh, 45 to 50 tons of hydrogen on a daily basis. Then we have our own plant operating or under construction that will be all operating in 2022 with Georgia 15 tons per day, South Central 15 tons per day, New York, California, and Texas 45 tons per day. So we are talking about 120 megawatt worth lift such. So we'll be achieving 500 tons per day of production only in the US for green hydrogen. But what do we do in our plant? This one is the one plant that we have in Georgia. Uh, you can see all the liquefaction tower. And then we put electrolyzer powered 100% by renewable so power. We produce the hydrogen in gases here with our state of the art PAM electrolyzer. We put it in gas in this container. Then when the cost of the electricity is the cheapest you can get, uh, we liquefy the hydrogen and we store the hydrogen liquid to deliver all over the US. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very short, but I will share the presentation. Any question you should have, do not hesitate to send me an email or to contact my uh, partner, Carl Smith. He's very well known around the hydrogen uh, market in uh, South Africa. Do not hesitate to reach out to both of us. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, uh, Devon, and also to Carl Smith, as you mentioned, uh, South African person involved in plug power. Uh, I, I think if anybody had any doubts that green hydrogen is going to make an impact globally, not only in the future, but right now, today, uh, I, th I hope, I think this presentation may have dispelled those doubts. It is happening. It is happening now. Is happening at megawatt and gigawatt scale, and we cannot be left behind. This technology uh, it can be applied in South Africa. We have, as Devon had pointed out, and previous speakers, uh, huge competitive advantages in our God-given natural resources of wind and solar PV and long coastlines and cheap land. And this makes this an incredibly interesting opportunity that we have got to grasp. Uh, the technology is available and our natural resources uh, are just uh, perfect uh, to uh, give us what we need to be competitive, to produce hydrogen locally in South Africa for local use as well as for export. So thank you very much, uh, Devon, for that interesting insight about what is really happening on the ground right now. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our next two speakers, and that is uh, Payush Katakwa uh, and uh, Philip Koenig, uh, both of them from, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, from a Royal Haskoning DHV. So it's fantastic to have you here, uh, Payush, uh, and also to Philip. I see you are on the... Um, uh, you're also here. It's a joint presentation, but let me quickly introduce both of you. Piyush is a strategic and technical consultant, uh, dedicating his skills and expertise and international experience towards industrial energy transition. He contributes to project development from initial business, a case analysis to conceptual design. He's executing small and large scale feasibility studies on green hydrogen production, storage and distribution facilities in European ports and industrial clusters, leveraging digital in in innovation. He introduced parametric design to create scalable and flexible concept designs for hydrogen facilities. Also, he performed market studies to estimate future hydrogen demand scenarios in Western Europe for utility and energy network operators to support the investment decision process. He graduated from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands with an MSc in Chemical Engineering with Industrial Honours. Fantastic to have you join us from overseas, um, Piers. Uh, it's the technology that brings uh, world leaders together. Uh, and, uh, and, and you're able to interact with our South African audience. Philip Koning, of course, is a local at um, Royal Hess Koning DHB in South Africa. He's a registered professional engineer in South Africa, as well as a chartered engineer with Engineers Island. He has more than 35 ex years experience in electric power transmission and distribution and renewable energy industry, and has proficiency in feasibility studies, planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance of power 
uh, transmission and distribution, overhead traction, and renewable energy power systems. He served on several forums and committees, including as a member of the IEEE and CGRAE, and he's the current South African chairperson for the CGRAE Substations Study Committee. Philip is a senior energy consultant based in Johannesburg, and he graduated with a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering from the University of Johannesburg. And I think uh, Piyush is going to be our first presenter from Royal Hasconi, uh, DHV, and uh, followed by Philip. So over to you, Piyush. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's Philip here just to introduce ah. <laughs> introduce ourselves. And I'd like to express my, my gratitude and indeed an, an honor to participate in this webinar. So dear distinguished guests, distinguished presenters and co-presenters, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are here to, to talk to you about our involvement in, in green hydrogen and working towards uh, tomorrow's solutions today. So here, without further ado, you're quite right, Chris. I'd like to uh, hand over to Piyush to present our case studies in, in H2 and outline the potential challenges and opportunities within South Africa. Thank um, you, Philip. Thank you very much. Over to you, Piyush. So we will start with a short introduction of who we are, Royal House Coding DHV, and then we will jump into our opinion on the hydrogen economy. We will also share our two highlighted case study that we are conducting in the Netherlands and in the United Kingdom. And of course, at the end, we will share our local perspective from South Africa. Starting with our introduction itself, um, Royal House Coding DHV is an independent consultancy which integrates 140 years of engineering experience with digital and software solutions. Uh, our ambition is to be a strong international and independent engineering consultancy firm while leading in innovation and sustainability where we take our role to design, safeguard, and maintain the built environment in different markets from infrastructure to mobility, buildings to energy, as well as water supplies to industrial sites. Uh, noting our presence in the world, we are backed by our expertise of almost 6,000 colleagues. We are helping organization um, to transform strategy into action, data into opportunities, and definitely implementation into the practical steps that will build resilient operation. Our ambition is to have a positive impact on people and our living environment. That's why we have also committed that we will have our own operation being net zero for greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Next year, we'll be celebrating our 100 years in South Africa and will continue to address complex challenges in climate change, business resilience, and digital transformation working in partnership with our public and private sector clients, therefore continually serving our purpose to announce society together. To take you through a, a quick whistle stop tour of the, the typical clients that we, <clears throat> that we have in, in Europe, um, I'm not gonna elaborate on all of them, but you can clearly see there are a number of uh, power and energy related clients within our European fold with uh, big names like uh, Vestas, RWE, EDF uh, popping up on the, on the screen. EDF taking the, um, the, the thread back into, into Africa. Some of, some of those companies like EDF is in South Africa and some of the South African clients we can see on the screen at the moment there is uh, again a lot of the the local and district municipalities a lot of parastatal uh, agencies and clients over there there are some construction companies and epc companies uh, right in the middle we can see uh, escom the power utility that we're doing work for and at the bottom the one with the with the rising sun there uh, we uh, we heard of the sezs uh, the development zones, the Kucha development zone is also one of our uh, clients that we've done some work for before. Further diving into the topic now, given the essence of the presentation of, as well towards hydrogen economy, we know that hydrogen is and will contribute to the global energy transition. 
And we also know that it is one piece of the puzzle. The role of hydrogen is definitely critical, but secondary to direct electrification. Of course, coming other alternatives like renewable energy efficiency, related e-fuels, but also our own behavioral change, which will impact the future energy consumption. The International Energy Agency has developed the net emission, net zero emission scenario, estimating the increasing share of hydrogen in total final energy consumption. In 2020, hydrogen and hydrogen-based e-fuels accounted for less than 0.1%, However, they are estimated to grow towards 10% in 2050. And other studies also deliberating more than 10% towards 20 to 30%, which is driven by local geographies and politics situations. Eventually, IEA also estimate that a cumulative carbon reduction of 6.5% can be achieved from 2021 towards 2030 by transforming towards green hydrogen. We also do have to realize that hydrogen requires a cross-sectoral approach where there are certain hard to abate sectors where hydrogen would definitely be critical. The priority uses for hydrogen are to decarbonize heavy industries. Think about ammonia industry where hydrogen is already being utilized, chemicals, uh, steel, which could play a big role. And of course, mining operations where there could be a potential opportunity from South African context. Additional to that, shipping and aviation can also supplement the demand. In shipping, ammonia could play a key role, uh, followed by aviation where related development via hydrogen towards synthetic e-fuels can further boost the demand. However, in the power sector, there might be limited opportunities majorly focusing on energy storage and system balancing. Uh, we do witness that in road transport, battery electric cars are, have come to completely dominate the electric vehicle market, whereas hydrogen might, vehicles might hit the market, but their applications will be limited to heavy goods and long range. Um, the hydrogen demand from the industrial sector will be largely driven by the necessity to shift to the decarbonized production of steel and chemicals where hydrogen could also play a role as a feedstock or a reagent. Um, eventually, until now, the deployment of low carbon technologies has suffered from the chicken and egg problem. Without reliable demand, there's no reliable supply. And without reliable supply, there's no reliable demand. And we foresee the solution to that is to create infrastructure investment and ensure proper implementation by adopting early infrastructure around hydrogen hubs, like in industry and ports, which can also include the export hub. And we at Royal Housecoding DHV are helping to identify the applications which are attractive now and will so remain in the future. We do that by assessing risk and challenges in relation to the project context and variables starting from the large scale wind and solar deployment, integrating with the new or existing electrical infrastructure to connect with the best available technology for hydrogen production. And this also requires us to further unlock potential of existing infrastructure like pipelines or road transport and further boosting supply with storage provisions, for example, salt caverns or tanks for temporary supply. Thereafter, helping to create resilient facilities for distribution like at port facilities. And of course, last but not the least, finally ensuring that the supply integrates with your demand with the help of our experts in aviation industry and shipping. Throughout this value chain, we critically investigate financial aspect by executing feasibility uh, studies and market investigations supplemented by roadmap scenario studies inclusive of organizational aspect where we deliver our legal and strategic advice. And of course, our technological aspect where we look into the fundamentals of parametric design, balance of plants, further supplementing with our health and safety expertise, permitting and supply chain logistic. 
Um, using this expertise, we would also like to share our two case studies, first in the Netherlands, where we are looking at integrating large scale electrolysis production for green hydrogen with our client Institute for Sustainable Process Technology. Current hydrogen production via electrolysis is currently only done in a scale of a couple of megawatts. However, to fulfill the demand for hydrogen, in this case for the Dutch industry, a significant scale up is required. But to achieve that goal, the technology needs to be deployed in a large scale, which is economically and operationally can be integrated with industrial cluster and ports. So we are contributing to this study uh, with our parametric design to estimate the required space for gigawatt electrolysis plant, including the required infrastructure and hydrogen demand. Given that a study of such a significant national inventory with immense uncertainties around uh, technology development, safety considerations and regulations was not done yet, we introduce our parametric way of working. And this enabled us to assess different hydrogen production and technology options with provisions to include existing assets and infrastructure and constraints, for example, around exclusion zone from health and safety perspective under one tool of parametric. This also helped us to develop optimized layout and 3D design of such a novel large scale one gigawatt facility. Uh, thereby we help in driving the progress in the design and development of economically viable green hydrogen facilities of this scale. Next to that, coming towards the demand side, uh, our next study with Port of London Authority our study focuses on end user constant and port infrastructure. We have been appointed to investigate the potential energy provision options and associated infrastructure requirement needed to decarbonize Port of London's operation by 2040. However, there's quite some uncertainties amongst which low carbon technology to choose and what would be the required infrastructure around it. So the aim of our study is to assess the energy solution and infrastructure required to support decarbonization of Port of London. Also in order to improve certainty for adoption of low carbon technologies for operators on the river Thames, including the Port of London's own vessel. Um, this will also help the Port of London and the wider community of the Thames region to make their investment decisions. We do that by a certain approach. The approach we executed accounted for the rapidly changing energy transition landscape by developing tools and methods that can be easily reviewed and updated given the changing energy transition context. For example, base of commercial scalability of alternative fuels or technology solutions or a different policy announcement. Our first phase evaluated different needs required along the Thames River between now and 2014, sorry, 2050, when the UK is legally obliged to achieve net zero uh, based on the stakeholder contribution and also the pre previous research that we have undertaken. So here we investigated crucial factors, including the speed of the technological change in the maritime sector, both for inland and international shipping fleets, the future growth in the maritime market, the geographic constraints, the safety aspect, supply chain, current regulations, and commercial viability. And in the current phase, which is the second phase, we are addressing the feasibility of, delivery, of delivering the hydrogen and related fuels technical solution at specific representative sites at the Thames region along Port of London. And here we are gauging the pros and cons of the best suited solution, including cost, spatial, the infrastructure need, resulting in a likely scenario for business cases, which are future proof. And of course, the challenges we see right now, for example, deploying the large scale bunker barge or uncertain regulations are taking more shape because there's a huge demand towards decarbonization with stricter policy. So these are our two key case studies that we are ongoing right now in UK and Netherlands. 
Now we'll move towards a local perspective from South Africa region. Uh, if we look at the local perspective, um, I think it's uh, affirmation of the, the previous presentations that we've seen this afternoon. There's no doubt that there are good opportunities in South Africa. And South Africa is, is ideally poised to be part of the hydrogen economy, the hydrogen value, value chain. And that is supported by our current infrastructure and the solar energy resource within our country, and the very good wind energy resource within our country. But we, we must realize that that uniqueness doesn't make us the only country uh, in, in the world. We do face competition. Uh, there's definitely competition from other companies within the Southern Hemisphere that have got equally good solar um, and wind capabilities. Argentina, for example, Chile has joined the race recently. Uh, we do see that Saudi Arabia uh, and also Morocco are interested and have got some uh, some plans and some strategic focuses on the, on the, their hydrogen economy. So you know, keeping that in mind, one must realize that the logistical chain uh, to, to Europe is relatively short from those countries, that is Morocco and, and Saudi Arabia. Um, we do have the capability uh, and we have got the experience locally in, the, in South Africa to integrate the public and the private sector institutions. We've got that experience. You've seen that with our, um, our client list and the 100 years of, of experience and presence in our country supports that. Um, we, we do have the capability then to unlock the infrastructure potential as well um, and, and also assist in, in setting clear targets and a prioritized roadmap because we've seen that before. I think it was very good in the Boston consulting presentation. If one looks at the, the figures and the numbers and the amount of, of gigawatts and, and teratons of, of hydrogen required, that rollout map is, is, is vital, really important to setting targets for our country to enable that we can get to the net zero emissions by 2050. Um, that, of course, does require uh, the unlocking of the of the infrastructure systems and i've said before we've got the capability and speak to us we we do know how to unlock those those infrastructure uh, capabilities we saw the uh, boston consulting's roadmap there of the of the highways running down up and down south africa and those pipelines we are connected to those clients we've done quite a lot of that work as consulting engineering and design engineers in the past. So we the go-to people for, for assisting in unlocking that infrastructure within this country. And that of course is supplemented by, by usually colleagues with the excellent uh, port capabilities, similar to the case studies that we've seen. Now, none of this is, is feasible without stable investment. The capabilities that we do have and that like is colleagues and even us in, in this local, uh, offices here um, have engaged with financiers before, before we've got the capabilities and the abilities to do all the feasibility studies, the pre-feasibility studies, to do all the financial close calculations and assist in, in establishing a stable investment uh, framework within this country, because that, that is crucial, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without that money, of course, the projects don't realize anywhere. So another Another vital um, petal to this flower, if I can call it that, is the development of the clear hydrogen regulations and standards within this country. That is a, an up-teen requirement. Hydrogen is is not uh, is is a is a product that requires health and safety requirements. It requires strict standards to operate with and and to and to handle it with. We've got the capabilities and the abilities to assist in that looking at the whole distribution chain from the, the, the uh, generation, the distributors, the transport, depicting the clear targets per sector and per industry for the future hydrogen demand. So with all of that in place, Royal Oscoding, I believe, is your, is your go-to company uh, to working towards tomorrow's solutions today within a greener environment and a greener hydrogen space. So 
So without further ado, the invitation is open to everybody. Please contact us. We're looking forward to your calls um, and your, your questions also in the, in the chat here after, but we're definitely looking forward to your calls. Here are our contact details of the local office. Um, and please, let's, let's, uh, let's start the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Payush and to Philip for that presentation. And I think what we're seeing here and what we've seen in pre previous presentations is uh, firstly, uh, a local capability. Uh, and uh, secondly, good local resources that we can team up and partner with uh, uh, international uh, players that have got experience, uh, you know, at the design, at the study, at the equipment uh, level, and put these together uh, with a good business case that can be delivered in South Africa. I think we can do something here uh, if we uh, make a move and not get left behind. So thank you very much to Piyush and to Philip uh, for that uh, input. And now it's my pleasure to sort of open the, the question and answer session. I've got quite a lot of questions and answers, uh, questions here to be answered uh, by our panelists. You are welcome to put on your videos, panelists, uh, uh, and, 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 and I, I will address some of these questions to you. But uh, I, I see a question here from uh, Tlumeka Mbata and John Fantonda, both asking the same question. Uh, Roberto, if you are still there. Roberto, we heard about a study tour. Uh, to Europe to look at uh, these things uh, and what uh, you are, what is being done. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this study tour? And I know the question is, people are asking, how can we join this study tour? Uh, you know, is it open? You have to pay? How does it work? Uh, but maybe you can just fill us in, Roberto, on, on this study tour of yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thanks for the questions. I saw actually in the chat box uh, that there were quite a lot of questions on the study tour. So that's another way that witnesses actually the interest that people have uh, for seeing what is going on in this area. The study tour actually is uh, an initiative we have taken. Uh, it is a first one uh, and it's quite limited. Uh, it's not that we intended to select uh, specific people uh, for the sake of selecting specific people, but it's meant to be just a, a group of 10, 12 people, mainly from the government and from think tanks, uh, in order to promote uh, and uh, in order to expose, uh, sorry, first of all, these people to what is going on in Europe in terms of the policy environment, in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of what the private and the public sector are doing, and exactly in order to see a bit what Europe is doing for, for creating an enabling environment. Uh, because uh, I think one of the conclusions of the presentations of today was exactly that the opportunities and the potential for South Africa are certainly there. What we need now is really an enabling environment on the different uh, areas. And this is what we intend to share. So Theo from our project uh, is also present here. He's in charge with the study tour. We are very disappointed because we wanted to have it done this, uh, um, in the coming week actually, at the end of this week and beginning of next week. But unfortunately the pandemic is not on our side. And uh, with the lockdown regulations coming in in Europe, uh, we were obliged to postpone. But I was the first one saying if we postpone, we need to give certainty about dates. Uh, so we are proposing to do it at the end of uh, uh, February, pandemic allowing, and the participants in the study tour are sort of ambassador for spreading then the message uh, to, to a further public uh, here in South Africa. So I really hope that this is first of a, a numerous, um, a higher number of study tours, uh, but uh, rest reassured, uh, it is limited at this stage, uh, but the results uh, and the future is open to everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Roberto, for that. Uh, I want to just, uh, a number of questions came up from uh, Duncan Ramsbottom. And I must say, uh, he expressed a degree of skepticism, if I may say that. Uh, Duncan, I, I hope your skepticism, uh, you know, was, uh, was put to rest by some of the presentations, but uh, perhaps not. So, I mean, just a few of the questions that, that, that Duncan put, uh, trying to, I think, instill a sense of realism. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, that we've talked about trains in Cape Town. 
geez, the train industry in Cape Town seems like it's up in flames. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, is there really a market for, for hydrogen in trains in the Cape? Um, I, I don't know, but that was a question uh, from Duncan. Uh, and, and, and I'm just looking at some of his other questions. I mean, he was talking about, wow, you know, we need 130 gigawatts of, uh, of capacity uh, to produce the South Africa's target of six megatons per annum by 2050. 130 gigawatts is like three times the, uh, you know, the size of South Africa's current electricity grid. Uh, so I, I, I want to just put it to you guys on the panel. Is this a pipe dream? Uh, is there room for skepticism and skeptics uh, like Duncan? Uh, or is this real? Certainly, uh, uh, you know, Devon was indicating that this is real. Devon, I don't know if you're still on the line there, but can you come in here and tell us how real this is? I mean, certainly from your presentation, it looked pretty real to me. It, it is real. Uh, we have requests on a weekly basis for projects in South Africa, mostly coming from private sector, and I know there is not subsidies available or nothing, but as I mentioned, we plug power are not waiting for subsidies to make it happen. We are already making it happen. You have seen that. We are building our own plan. We are building plan together with partners. Uh, so subsidies will help some project to move to 90% uh, to 100% uh, decision. But uh, you have some major player in South Africa that are keen to move as soon as possible, mostly around the chemical industry, the steel industry, and obviously the mining industry. And I think they need to start as soon as possible. And if they wait for subsidies, the train will go and South Africa will not be in the train. And it's what we are seeing in some other country in Europe. You know, I manage Europe as well. I can tell you some countries are pushing, are being the first one, are deploying and are doing. Some other are waiting for the subsidies. Uh, living, in, uh, living in France at the moment, I can tell you, everyone waiting for the subsidies. But when I see what's happening in Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, they are all building at the moment the site. So uh, let's be sure that we all push together uh, the big major company that have engaged to move to green energy, uh, that they move. Not thanks, thanks Devon. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, a very upbeat view that this is uh, happening and we better not be left behind. Question uh, I, I see here from Johan Oppermann uh, talks about, you know, uh, we have heard uh, stuff from government. We heard the CEO of Sassel. We even heard the president mention the word Buchelbai. Uh, this is apparently a completely new port, you know, green grass, green fields. Uh, well, there's no grass up there. There's no grass at all, but a, a green fields uh, project. Uh, and, and obviously, that's a sort of a mega project. On the other hand, uh, we've heard today what I could think maybe are some medium-sized projects at, at smaller ports, Saldana Bay, Kucha, uh, and, and, and then uh, there are uh, uh, smaller scale projects. I mean, in the previous webinar, we heard about producing uh, hydrogen from uh, gasification of waste streams, uh, which could be in the municipal sector. Uh, and this is happening, uh, you know, the small... My question really now is to Thomas. Thomas, uh, where does Buchubai fit into this? You talked about um, Saldana and uh, Kucha and, 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 and uh, uh, where does it all fit together? Small, medium or large scale projects? Okay, I think possibly what we're looking at is a, is, is a crisis of opportunities and uh, the one does not negate the other. The Buchubai looks exciting. It's a good resource area. It makes sense. But it doesn't exist yet. We have existing ports. What are we trying to do? We are trying to sell large volumes of green hydrogen to overseas customers. We need to persuade them that we can deliver. We need to persuade them that our regulatory, our compliance, our um, uh, uh, organizational, our legal, and our offtake agreement now is going to get us there. Let us cut our teeth with infrastructure we already have and get some kilograms moving. By all means, investigate Buchubai. Start building the port, but don't let your first molecule you export be on the basis of a promise of a port that doesn't exist to an, off, uh, to an overseas customer who has yet to see evidence of traction. 
let's take an inter incremental approach to manage risk. And by doing, we then have hydrogen volumes available at existing built up areas for decarbonization. It doesn't negate Bukhuba. Returning to the issue of the train raised by uh, um, uh, Duncan, I believe, he's completely right. And why are the trains falling apart? Because of pan, uh, a persistent and uh, uh, destructive cable theft. Cable theft is because of the, the worldwide desire for copper and for desperate communities looking to um, find a way to survive. If you take away the overhead cable, there is no train service. So he's right. So what is your alternative? You introduce a diesel locomotive. Diesel locomotives are smelly, noisy, and don't help the climate. Compared to a diesel locomotive, a fuel cell locomotive is clean and it restores the operation to get workers to work on time. So you don't frustrate them so they don't burn down the train stations. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, uh, for those insights. Um, I, I want to just uh, also uh, talk about um, and, and really pose this uh, to Kesh, if I may. Uh, Kesh, you were talking about all the different colors of hydrogen. We, you know, we, we, we've kind of heard, it, heard this. Uh, and, and you talked about blue hydrogen uh, and um, underground, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, you know, to ensure that it is blue hydrogen and not black hydrogen or gray hydrogen. But in South Africa, we don't really have a gas source uh, to speak of. And uh, our I'm told that our geological conditions uh, for uh, for carbon capture and storage are not uh, ideal. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering about the pathway. Is there actually in South Africa a transitional pathway uh, for, for blue hydrogen? Um, or, uh, and, and this is a two-edged sword, it would be nice to have a pathway, but if we don't have it, the upside is that we we might be forced to become a first mover in green hydrogen and leapfrog this transition and become one of those players that gain early experience in green hydrogen. Yes, maybe at a higher price. Yes, maybe subsidized uh, even with European subsidies. But at least we are in from the beginning with the green hydrogen option and not a transitionary option, which could be a bit of a diversion. And certainly for South Africa, that's not really available. So if I can just ask you, Kesh, about the pathways for South Africa, what do you see the pathway? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Chris. And I think um, the way to think about it is, I guess there's two, two sides to the equation, right? There's a supply component and a demand component. So I think countries globally are taking a position on whether you go down the blue hydrogen route the green hydrogen route or some sort of hybrid. And I think countries globally also from a demand perspective are saying, well, we'll accept green hydrogen or we won't. Particularly in Europe, I think the picture is quite fragmented. I think Germany are more um, uh, skewed towards green versus somewhere like the UK who sees blue as a transitionary mechanism. So I think the playing field is open globally from a demand perspective. When we look at South Africa and we've done some modeling on sort of the CCS uh, availability in SA, I think the biggest uncertainty is around those sinks and how permeable they are and whether they're actually useful. So I think given that uncertainty, given the distances that we would need to talk off here, I mean, we were modeling costs up to sort of 60 to $100 per ton of CO2 abated for, for CCUS. So the, the cost is highly prohibitive. The sinks are unproven. So, so in our view, I think green hydrogen will probably be the pure play path for South Africa. Uh, we will probably skip the blue hydrogen path um, given, given that uncertainty, right? Um, and I think... Having said that, it doesn't preclude us from playing in the global market. As I said, on the demand side, there are countries who are looking exclusively at green, some are looking at blue. And so if you look at Saudi, they have a big blue hydrogen play, uh, particularly focused on you know, countries looking at, at accepting that, potentially in, the, in Southeast Asian countries, Korea, for example, who would look at co-firing blue ammonia in the power plant. So there's a market for each of those. Uh, I think for South Africa's view, we'll probably go down the green hydrogen pathway and focus on, 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 on targeting those green hydrogen markets uh, uh, initially in Europe. Mm, thank you. Um, I, I want to go back to Devon, uh, if I may. Uh, Devon, uh, there were some questions about what do you need in terms of electric power from renewable energy or whatever source uh, for your hydrolyzers? Um, in other words, uh, to make obviously hydrogen competitively, I would imagine you need to run these hydrolyzers with a pretty high capacity factor. 
um, and not just rely on, let's say, solar power exclusively, which would only generate electricity during the daylight hours. Uh, so my question is, to what extent do you need a high uh, constant electricity supply 24-7 in order to produce uh, hydrogen competitively with your hydrolyzers? So that's a very good question, but it all depends to the end user and what they want to do or the subsidies we are able to get on the price of the kilogram. Some end user want to pay zero for the green hydrogen. Some of them want to pay $1. Some of them are ready to pay $5. In the mobility sector, we are able to go up to $8 per kilogram. So it all depends on the end user that you get. Um, the highest the best way will be to have a mix. So you can have some wind turbines, some PV sources, but still you are between uh, 50 to 60% maximum capacity factor. So sometime you will be able to produce 60% of your production being green hydrogen and 40% of your production being blue or gray hydrogen. At the end, you are able to justify uh, to your customer, 60% of your production is green ammonia or green methanol, etc. And um, I think it's more the way to go down the end line. So we need to have a transition phase. And as soon as we will have much more renewable power available, we will start to, we will try to energize as much as possible to get green energy. But today the renewable sources are limited, but we need to start now. If we start and we wait all the renewable sources to be available, then we will start in 2040, but it will be too late. Uh, so let's start now with what we have available and let's uh, uh, go to the way and uh, go to the green hydrogen as much as possible. But we need to start. Thank you, Devon. If I may put this to you, uh, Piyush. Uh, Piyush, um, uh, from a European perspective, obviously, uh, you know, South Africa, as was pointed out, uh, is going to be one of the countries possibly that uh, supplies. Um, and there are others, our competitors, uh, and names like Chile have been mentioned, obviously a much longer delivery supply chain. Uh, South Africa, also quite long, but not as long. Uh, but then countries like uh, Morocco, North Africa, Middle East. Um, I mean, what, what, what a competitive advantage are we going to have as South Africa when there are other countries with excellent wind and solar resources, as well as cheap land, are we in this game or not? Uh, 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 and, and I just noticed that uh, you know Namibia, our northern neighbor, uh, is is moving quicker than South Africa, it seems. And 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 I read recently uh, some plans for some very serious. Uh, hydrogen production uh, in, in Namibia. So I'm just asking the question is, 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 are we as competitive as we think we are or could be, um, or, or are we going to beaten, be beaten by North Africa and the Middle East? Um, that's a very important question, Chris. Uh, thanks for raising it. Uh, well, I would say that def uh, definitely competition is a big thing, but apart from that, there's a huge market out there which can not only be taken by only one country per se. Eventually, what's good in South Africa is definitely the vast availability of renewable energy for in terms of solar and wind, but also uh, and consolidating the domestic market, given the industry, the mining, the fuel cell vehicle, will help create the economies of scale before embarking on ambitious, let's say, export opportunities. While simultaneously, South Africa can start leveraging on the international funds to develop these export infrastructure as well. So uh, we, our recommendation would definitely be to start with um, consolidating domestic demand and creating infrastructure on existing uh, industrial clusters and start making hydrogen hubs while simultaneously looking at the international funds, which can help leverage the export infrastructure as well. Thanks very much, Piyush. Uh, look, there were also a number of questions, several questions about uh, you know, water, how much water is needed? Does it have to be clean water? Uh, can you use brackish water? Can you use seawater? And, and I think some mention was made about desalination and that the cost of desalination is almost insignificant in the whole, in the whole uh, you know, scheme of things. Uh, but, um, and there was also questions about, uh, you know, what do you do with the, 
um, the stuff that's left behind after you electrolyze water or desalinate water, is this a waste stream that is hard to handle? Uh, or is this a waste stream that can be easily handled? I don't know who's the right person to uh, look at this question, but Kesh, maybe you can come in here and give us your insights. You've done a study in South Africa. You've been working with BUSA and the National Business Initiative. But, uh, where do you see the, how do you see water as an issue and the, um, the waste streams from the production of, of hydrogen? Yeah. No, I'm happy to come in, Chris. But, but I think, um, look, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, I think, is, is the caveat that I would put behind this, right? Like we say the economics makes sense when you model it. The cost of desalination when amortized into the levelized cost of hydrogen is negligible. But is it going to be easy to orchestrate the scale and deal with all the waste? Probably not, right? Having said that, there are solutions out there. I mean, there are disposal methods where you use sort of surface water discharge, sewage discharge, et cetera. All of that needs to be investigated. And you also need to look at treatment technologies. Uh, so membrane-based membrane technologies, thermal-based technologies, you know, there's a bunch of different option spaces out there um, that need to be investigated. Um, and, and it's not going to be easy, but it's something that must be done, particularly when we look at the opportunity that's seen on the green hydrogen side downstream. And then secondly, when we think about the water security challenge that we will face in the longer term, particularly as a water scarce country. Uh, and we've also modeled sort of the adaptation or physical risk of, of, of climate change for South Africa and a two degree rise in temperature globally is a four degree rise in temperature in SA. So we're a water scarce country today, it'll get worse in the future. So, so this is almost solving for two problems, uh, if that makes sense. Thanks, Kesh. Uh, look, I think we're gonna to have to make this the very last question. And if I may address this to Thomas. Um, Thomas, you know, there've been a couple of people that have talked about the, you know, the, the danger of hydrogen. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, uh, Philip actually talked about, uh, you know, the safety issues around handling of hydrogen, etc. I mean, everybody has got this picture in their head of the Hindenburg, uh, and, 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 and it puts the fear of the living God into a lot of people that we're going to build a whole economy now about this stuff that blew up the Hindenburg. Um, but can you sort of contextualize the safety aspects, the danger? I mean, hydrogen in, in vehicles, in trucks, in buses, is this a danger if there's an accident or whatever? But can you just put this into perspective to people that may not know, including myself? I think the issue here is what risks we prepare to live with. Um, people are terrified of flying an aircraft because of the danger of an accident. Some people won't fly but they'll happily cross a road and they'll go into traffic every day where the risk of death is significantly higher. Um, hydrogen is, it has safety concerns. You don't start working on hydrogen without a very cogent and uh, rigorous safety plan. Um, hydrogen is combustible. Hydrogen can be explosive when it's in a, 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 a mixture with air. But let's look at a hydrogen vehicle crash compared with a gasoline vehicle crash. When you crash in a petrol-powered vehicle, the petrol leaks from the tank and pools below the car and cooks everyone in the car. Somehow we're okay with that. If you have a hydrogen vehicle and there is a hydrogen leak, hydrogen is significantly less dense than air, so you have a vertical flame. It doesn't pool. Your risk is to make sure you don't have a mixture of hydrogen and air pre-combustion. That's where things get tricky. And these are all design issues. Um, uh, they are not issues that we as South Africans, with all respect, need to solve. They are issues which we need to adopt that have been crossed already by the Germans, the Japanese, the Americans. We don't have to solve this problem a priori. We will probably solve some of them uh, in collaboration, but for the most part, we will inherit equipment from overseas. We do that with fuel. We do that with propane burners. We do that with a number of other things which are dangerous. It's not to downplay hydrogen. It's to understand that you're in, a, in a, um, uh, an engineering environment. And uh, when you engineer your solutions, ultimately you shield the public. Thomas, thank you for that and putting it into perspective. Uh, I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to draw it to a close. Uh, we could go on for a long time, but we're already 15 minutes overdue. 
It's been a fascinating discussion. I've enjoyed the presentations immensely. I've enjoyed the discussions. And it's just now left to me to hand over to my colleague, Roberto at the European Union, uh, uh, delegation to South Africa to say a few words, uh, offer some words of wisdom in parting and, uh, and to uh, do the honors in closing the, the webinar for the day. Over to you, Roberto. Thank you, Chris. And you're creating a lot of expectations by giving me the role to offer words of wisdom. I think the wisdom is in each of us and we just need to pick it up with the right condition and the right environment. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank very much all the panelists and the speakers. Cash from Boston Consulting, Thomas and Linda Kule from CSIR, Devon and Carl from Plug Power, and, Roy and Philip and Piyush from Royal Huskening. It has been great hearing you, great listening to your presentations, and it's really always enriching my spirit specifically, which is a spirit of a lawyer. And I'm getting, when I'm getting into discussions which are so technical and so engineering related, I'm always flabbergasted by the opportunities that nature is offering to us. So I wanted to thank then you, Chris, for having so skillfully managed and moderated this webinar. And let's not forget also Theo, uh, Theo Kovari, who's here with us from the, our project EU South Africa Partners for Growth. Theo is our expert uh, dealing with energy issues and is helping us incredibly on all issues. And last but not least, also um, uh, my uh, colleague uh, Darren in my section, who has been following energy issues with uh, devotion and motivation. And of course, and my ambassador, at, um, first of all, for having uh, participated in and offered the, the opening remarks, uh, in fact. So uh, I wanted just to conclude this uh, by reiterating that uh, I think we all agree that there is there are incredible opportunities uh, and the potentials are great uh, for green hydrogen uh, here in South Africa. The conditions are there in terms of technology. Uh, there are opportunities in terms of participating in value chains. Uh, I liked a lot of what Cash said, uh, that the green hydrogen alone has a potential of creating 1.8 million jobs. And in a society like South Africa that so desperately needs jobs with the appropriate skills, with the appropriate policies, there are huge opportunities. But of course, these opportunities can be unlocked only if you have the right conditions and an enabling environment. And this is where we all have to focus on. So enabling environment means having a policy environment in place. We mentioned actually a policy from an industrial perspective. Green hydrogen must be part of an industrial policy in South Africa that is actually giving the right incentives in order to move in this direction. A policy also in terms of regulations and standards and as I said, also policy in terms of incentivizing uh, uh, this uh, power fuel uh, compared to other sources of uh, energy. Uh, enabling environment means uh, also having the due coordination amongst uh, all stakeholders, uh, the public sector and the public sector hand in hand together, and also having a stable investment framework. Uh, I think it was Philip uh, from Royal Haskening that mentioned that, it is important to have the right investments in the right infrastructure. And to do that, you need also the right framework and the right investment climate for this. So I just reiterate, reiterate in conclusion that as EU, we stand behind South Africa. We are very happy that South Africa is taking the lead and we stand behind and we are happy to align behind the priorities that South Africa is establishing in green hydrogen. And the next step will be the study tour. So I'm looking forward also to a fruitful, uh, positive study tour, hopefully already in February, and then we can disseminate uh, the results and the findings of the study tour to the broader um, public. And Chris, I'm also looking forward to continuing our engagement with you and to further webinars and maybe events in person in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, audience. Uh, have a good afternoon and all the very best.